Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series. I am your host, Scott Daly, and I'm a constant reader. And I'm your co-host, Matt Freeman, and this is my first journey to the tower. And every day we get a little closer on that journey, Matt. We're almost Mm -hmm. there. We're Mm -hmm. almost there. This week on the show, we are sitting down, putting our feet up, and giving the song of Susanna one more listen. We're going to be discussing the sixth and penultimate book of this sept... sept... Septilogy? Yeah. Is that a sure. word? Yeah. Should um, be. It is now. Yeah. We've got a bunch of your questions to answer. It's uh, uh, You guys sent us in so many questions. I think you're all just very excited to see what Matt thinks is going to happen in the final book. So that's why you sent in so many questions. And we're going to be chatting with filmmaker, podcaster, and king nut Julia Marchesi about her love of Stephen King and her experience with The Dark Tower and some other things. We go on some some tangents with that conversation about uh, movies and movie theaters and and movie making um it's a it's a wonderful conversation that we really hope you enjoy it um so we're going to start with that conversation and then we're going to come back after we're done talking with julia and matt and i are going to answer some of your questions and mixed in with your questions we're going to be talking about this book so i'm pretty excited about this matt i think it's gonna be a good episode yeah me too it's very different from usual yeah, but uh, in a in a good way. This is yeah. what this is what we want this overview episode to be, right? We we've done we've done the legwork of diving deep into the story, and now we're just enjoying it and getting to talk with some other king nuts. Absolutely. All right, so let's go to Julia. All right, everybody, we've got Julia Marchesi here with us. Is that real? <laughs> Welcome, <laughs> Julia. Perfect, right? Hi. Hello. Thank you so much for joining the show, Julia. Um, I guess I, I want to start at the beginning of, of our interaction, I think, because the reason that I your name kind of fell into my lap is because every Sunday you you make my Twitter very busy, <laughs> uh, at least for the past few past few months, because you started doing something called Stephen King Sunday. Or I don't know if you started or I just got our Twitter account just got linked. To, I don't know if there's something you've been doing for a while or not, but yeah, it's something like, that, I, quite a while it's like a couple of years now oh wow okay uh because it's just like i you know i always have so much stephen king stuff going on in my life and i always have a book that i'm reading and so when i finish the book i take a picture of it and like do a little mini review of what i thought of it mm-hmm. uh and then just it went kind of started with the podcast and then could, went from there and i i have i need no excuse to post anything stephen king related <laughs> so so there you are. And so good. Yeah. And it's nice because like they've been brought up like a lot of cool discussions of, with all of the constant readers about the different artwork and the different, you know, movie stuff and books. It's really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, our podcast is relatively new in the the world of Stephen King. And um, I was telling Matt before we started this whole thing that like I've been a Stephen King fan forever, but I've never really been plugged into communities. And, and he is a brand new reader. I think he had read two books before we started this show going through the Dark Tower. So um, we've never been really plugged into a Stephen King community. And and I got to say, like, it's it's delightful. Like the, 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 the fa- Stephen King fans in the social media space are some of the most wonderful people I've ever had uh, the, the fortune to interact with. They're so nice. They're so excited. They're so eager for everything. And I think your, your big Stephen King Sunday posts is, is kind of my window into that a lot. Oh, well, I, thank you. That makes me feel good. Cause like you send out stuff and it kind of goes into the void. Right. And I'm like, right. I'm sending out this point, but what it, this post, but like, what does it mean? And like, if it actually helps you get connected to the other constant readers. And I agree the nicest folks, like they may, they have welcomed me with open arms and it makes me so happy. I can't even tell you, like <laughs> I'm part of the, I'm part of the losers club and I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've been avoiding the fandom just because I'm trying to avoid spoilers. But yeah, when I do brush up against it, I'm like, wow, these people just love Stephen King. <laughs> this is so refreshing. <laughs> like, like normally a fandom is a thing where everyone just kind of tears down the thing that the fandom is for. And that's mm-hmm. not what this is. So yeah, surprising. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I, I made the mistake of, of saying on, I think on our first episode talking about Wolves of the Cala that many people in the fandom considered the the last three books the weakest of mm-hmm. the dark tower series and i was met with like immediate reproach from people who were like who's saying that that's ridiculous and i was like oh wait <laughs> these people are just all positive and lovely and uh-huh. it was it's been a real experience so i i guess i wanted to talk to you about like i think our, our friends over at the king cast lovingly 
call it uh, your Stephen King origin story. How did you get involved in in the wonderful world of Stephen King originally? Uh, so I started very young. I was about 11 and I read, I had a bus ride to and from school and I read uh, It and Pet Cemetery and Carrie kind of all at the same time. Um, and it just kind of blew my mind in, in the, like in Stephen King not only opened my world to his works, but also just horror in general, which I didn't mm-hmm. really like before that. Um, and it was so I read Pet Cemetery, and I was like, oh, I really liked it. And so then I watched the movie, and then I became kind of obsessed with Pet Cemetery. And I'd show it to all my friends. And I dressed like Gage for Halloween one year, like the like <laughs> post Mick Mac burial ground Gage, which at, in like seventh grade is not very cool. <laughs> Like seventh grade girls don't think that's cool, but I thought it was cool. Um, and so it just kind of went from there. Like it was just, I, you know, and I go through this and I, I love that his, his stuff is all kind of about outsiders and mm-hmm. like, and, and the, like that kind of made me feel, I think that's part, part of what makes people feel connected to his works is like everybody, everybody kind of inside always kind of feels like they're an outsider. So like you can connect with all the, these characters um, and so I've been read, I've been reading his books forever. And then I, I had never read the dark tower series and I was like, what am I doing? He's like, he says, it's this masterwork. <laughs> I better get on this. Right. So, um, I started to read it and just fell in love with it completely. Uh, and just like, uh, couldn't get enough of it. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm of the sort of person who I get really sad when books end. Like, mm-hmm. especially if it's a book I really enjoy, I really don't want it to end. Um, and I get real like fussy about it. <laughs> so, um, what happened was that I read through uh, up up to uh, the eleventh chapter in Song of Susanna, uh, and then stopped because I, I couldn't turn the page because I was too excited because this is the most exciting journey I've ever been on in books before, and I was like, I can't, I can't, it's too excited. So um, I ended up stopping um, to read everything connected to the Dark Tower, um, which is a lot. Um, <laughs> yes. And it, yeah. And it started out kind of small. And then I realized like how far the connections went and it started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, cause they have on Stephen King's website, they have the official connections, um, and the user submitted connections. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's also ones that I've come up with as well. So this has been two and a half years that I've been reading and I'm still, still going. <laughs> and it's like the best <laughs> it's like the, cause it's a literary puzzle piece that like at the beginning, I didn't see how everything connected, but now I'm starting to see how things connect and like yeah. how joyous that is. And then that means when I finish the series, I'm going to get everything. I'm going to get every reference. I'm like, that's what I want. I want like to know everything about it. Sure. So it's fucking joyous and I love it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think this is why we wanted you on on this episode in particular. Um, and actually, you like when I first reached out to you, you said, no, I can't be on that episode because I haven't finished the book. And I was like, no, that's like the reason I want you on this episode, because I just want to sit you down and be like, that's crazy. How did you stop? <laughs> um, because I, for, for those that might not remember all the, the chapter numbers in Song of Susanna, um, the chapter you stopped on or the chapter you stopped right before is one called The Writer. The Writer. And I think everyone knows exactly what part of that book that is now. Mm -hmm. And I just like, I don't know. I I don't know how you had the ability to stop at at this, this, this focal point of the books, this point where, where kind of everything changes around what these books are and what they're doing. And you were able to just sit here and go, no, I'll hold off on that for a little while. I'm just like, that's, that's crazy (laughs) to me. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's really just this like feeling like it's, it's such a crescendo to something that I hadn't, when I started the series, like that was not in my brain at all. I had no concept that that was going to, this, these, this series, we're going to go in that direction. So then when like, once they start giving a little hints at the direction it's going in and I'm like, oh my God, oh God, it's so good. (laughs) So it's, it's just like the same thing with, um, 112263, I think like once they got to Dallas, like the mm-hmm. day of, I was like, I can't, I can't do it. And I had to, I like put it aside <laughs> for a couple of months and I was like, oh, I can't finish it, man. I'm too excited. And then I had to like bring it back in. So <laughs> I'm of a strange sort of girl who gets that excited and like nervous about finishing a book. That's- I get it. I, I mean, I, I tend to get sad when I finish a book that I really loved. I, I, I can relate to that. Mm-hmm. Um Especially you if you the, love the characters and then you have to say goodbye to them. And like, that's, you know, they're your friends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We, <laughs> we, we've talked a bit about other Stephen King works. I have uh, like sort of the whole point of doing this is that I have, I have so little ke- Stephen King ex- exposure. Okay. Um, but, but like the funny thing is like everything we talk about, even down to stuff like stand by me, 
you can kind of find dark tower connections and it's not like <laughs> it's not like there's a magical doorway it's like this character is named chambers and mm-hmm. he kind of behaves the way you imagine jake might behave and mm-hmm. so it's more of a more of a uh who Stephen King is as a person connection rather than, Oh, he's weaving the dark tower throughout all, all of his universes. Um, mm-hmm. But that, that, I think that's a fascinating aspect to, you know, trying to hunt down all of the dark tower connections. Do you find that it's just like, Oh, everything has dark tower connections. No, no and it isn't everything. Um, and people assume that I've read everything and I haven't, but there's certain, there's certain ones that I haven't read. Like I haven't the green, the green mile, as far as I know is not connected. Um, mm-hmm. Mr. Mercedes series, I think is not connected. Um, but it's just like, it's like, I just, so I just started, I'm, I read multiple books of his at once as well. So, um, right now I'm reading, um, the Tommy knockers, uh, four past midnight and the girl who loved Tom Gordon. And I just finished rereading the wastelands. Um, and so in four, pa- in the Langoliers, in Tommy knockers and in Firestarter, it's all about the shop. They talk about the shop, like mm-hmm. the shop from Firestarter is in other things as well. So then you're like, oh, well, then these things connect to this. And like it all just like gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So in my brain, how my Dark Tower world works is that everything related to everything set in or mentioning Derry or Castle Rock are connected. Somehow. Sure, sure. Yeah. And and I, I, I just read The Green Mile. So this is the only reason I know this. But there is a loose reference in The Green Mile to like – and an all powerful white force. Ah, so okay. it, it is not directly related, but I mean, I think that's See, that kind of gets... now I'm going to have to add that one to my list, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. Sorry. I just extended your, your project a little bit. Longer, oh, don't be. But... I mean, I, I, I'm honestly at this point closer to reading most of his work than I thought I was. Like I checked mm-hmm. when I was doing my campaign and I was like, Oh yeah, I've read like pretty much everything, but there's just, I just, now I'm like, well, I might as well finish everything now. So whether yeah. it's dark connect, tower connected or not, yeah, I started a project, I think probably about the same time you started doing that, uh, to just reread all his books, um, starting from in publishing order. Um, I, there, there were a handful of them that I hadn't read, but I was just going to start from the beginning in publishing order and either read them for the first time or reread them. Um, and I've been going through that. And I think, I think when I started that, my original plan was like, I'll do this and I'll have all of it fresh in my mind for when Matt and I start the show. And obviously that, that didn't happen because it, there's a lot of books and it takes way longer than you think, but mm-hmm. uh, I'm up to desperation, which is I think the mid nineties. Uh, okay. So I've got, I've still got quite a way to go on this, okay. pro- on my project. Well, so. it's, but it's like, it's a, it's a pure joy though, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Of course. It's, it's so much fun. Um, and it's, yeah, I, like some of these books I read so long ago that it was like reading it the first time. And some of them it's like just revisiting an old friend. Um, it's, it's really wonderful. I remember uh, in junior high, like after I had read those three, I read Gerald's game. Mm. And I was like, as a kid, I was like, you know, I think I'm just too young for this one. I think I just don't get it. <laughs> and then I read it as an adult and I was like, no, no, I just don't like it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I get it. I just don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Both both Gerald's Game and Dolores Claiborne is like, you know, early 90s King trying to like experiment with form and structure. Mm-hmm. And I find them interesting in that regard, you know, that they're like, yes. he's trying to do something different. He's trying to change his tone and his voice a little bit and do something interesting and new. But I kind of agree with you. It doesn't, it, it doesn't come together all the way. I, I, the Gerald's Game movie adaptation. By, I, which uh, I haven't uh, seen yet, but I love Mike Flanagan. Uh, so I'm sure it's amazing. And the concept, so of good. course, is incredible, right? This woman who's handcuffed the whole time. Great. I yeah, love it. Yeah. But just, uh, no, just not. It's on the, the, on the lower end of my list. Sure, 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 sure. So uh, moving back to, to Dark Tower specifically, since, you know, that's technically, technically we're a Dark Tower pod, at least for another few months. <laughs> um, so what I guess what is it about the story that you just fell in love with right away? What is what is the Dark Tower story, at least up till chapter 11 of book six? What is mm-hmm. what does the story mean to you? I just, you know, it's all about falling in love with these characters. And, mm-hmm. you know, Roland starts out as someone who's so mysterious and then but is so enchanting and so alluring and you really want to get to know his backstory. And then you slowly get to do that. You get mm-hmm. to know his backstory. And so this is a weird thing, but so I, um, big movie fan, like I love pretty much all genres except, uh, war can't do it. Uh, and Westerns have never been particularly interesting to me. <laughs> and, and I've, you know, and then after reading this, I was like, Oh, I get it now. I get mm-hmm. Westerns now. And like, if I could watch, I could watch, any western now and i'm like oh if i just put roland in that main character place like i'll get it 
I'll get what his character is. Because those those kind of gunslinger characters are always so stoic, but you never yeah. get anything behind it. And so I'm like, I don't understand what you're doing, sir. You're just there being mean. Like, I don't get it. But now I'm like, oh, okay, if you have this kind of backstory of who this person is and how long they've been for, or like what they're fighting for, and like that kind of is interesting. And then of course you, you know, you once you start getting all these characters together and you fall in love with Jake and you fall in love with Oi and you fall in love with Eddie and Susanna and like every and just following them and you have no idea where it's going because everything they do looks like it's going to end terribly. So you're <laughs> like, this is just going to go terrible at any moment. Like anything can happen. Um, but the, I think the jump from, because the gunslinger is slower paced than the rest of the story. And sure. so I was like, I'm not really sure how I feel about it so far. And then like drawing the theo, I was like, well, holy fuck, man, look at that that's amazing like just that i like i i was i was my mind was blown just like all of the stuff with the doorways and going into other people's heads and i was like wow look at him go like it just kind of ramped up to like a thousand i was like okay on board um and then from there just everything was delightful Mm -hmm. yeah i think matt you had a similar experience right that like yeah you enjoyed the first book but it wasn't until the drawing that things really took off for you. yeah well well the first book um i mean roland is, is essentially a villain in that book <laughs> uh he, he's not he's not terribly likable in fact i would mm-hmm. say king went out of his way to make him someone that you were like oh, oh my god are we is this our main character um and 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 like i appreciated the book on a cerebral level but i was like oh it just kind of made me feel bad because yeah. he kills the kid and and, and then <laughs> drawing of the three is immediately like just fun just fun 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 from beginning to end and you're like okay okay i get i get i think where this is gonna go i'm 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 in for it right i was in for it from gunslinger but i didn't realize what experience i was actually signed up for quite yet. yeah exactly like just kind of ramps up in this whole different direction um mm-hmm. and the actually the moment that i fell in love with roland i can pinpoint it for you is uh when they come back from new york and eddie gives him a soda and he drinks it and like loses his mind because he's <laughs> never had soda before and he was just like can't get enough of it and it's just like up until then he's been this very stoic character and like that's such a human moment yeah. that it really was like oh now i really like you that like even you were like oh my god soda oh my god like that just like is so Mm -hmm. cute yeah that's that's a great point i I love that i mean i think that's that's stephen king kind of figuring out who he wants this guy to be because i do think when he originally envisioned this character when he wrote that first book he imagined him i think he even says it as like as the man with no name like this is supposed to be an archetype straight out of just just a western um and and he envisioned him that way. And then he couldn't help but Stephen King him, which is like poke at him and find out what makes him tick and who he is and and humanize him. And that's that's definitely what we see in the drawing of the three is he's he's beginning to humanize him in a way. Um, and it, it makes a, a fascinating journey. I, I think the soda part is is perfect. It is perfect because who would have thought to do that? Only Stephen King. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, the, and those are the moments in Stephen King that I like best. I think that the, these kind of he observes the world and sees all the little tiny things that most people don't pay attention to and those are the things that give his books the reality and the like honesty that draws people in because everybody's had these little tiny moments but nobody's ever thought to express them before and he does and it's uh always so enchanting Mm -hmm. yeah i I think uh, you said a little bit earlier that he was kind of your your introduction to horror that you weren't really a horror fan until you started reading Stephen King and I think like it kind of seems like it, the same thing with westerns right that like yeah and I think I think that's what he excels at is he he plays in genre but what he really cares about more than anything is character so like he can like the reason why we love horror movies and I think this is a, a famous Stephen King quote is like is like you're not scared of the monster you're scared for the characters um and and that that is that's like that's what he excels at that's what he understands and and that's why he can make you like a genre that you might not have given the time of day before I mean Matt you're not really into horror either right well, I'm not really into horror but ironically I don't really think the Dark Tower is horror but I mean yeah. it certainly has some in there um, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm particularly one way or the other uh, about horror. I, what I love is writers who are really sharp on their psychology and King nails that consistently. Uh, that's, sure. that's my favorite part. Yeah. Well, I think the sign of a bad horror movie is where you don't care about the characters, right? Cause then you don't care if they get killed or all you just yeah. like kill them. I don't care. 
unlike these people. So mm-hmm. like the, the fact that he understands you have to like them because if you feel like they could die at any moment, you're like, no, 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 please don't kill them. Then that's what it's supposed to be. And that's what I've always loved most about his works. And that's why it is one of my, like on my very top, because I just love all of those characters. And I've read it so many times that I, you know, I can see all the little pieces of them. And it's just, that's what makes him so special. Like you want to be friends with these characters. Mm-hmm. Or, or in the case of someone like Jack Moore, you're like, oh, I can't wait to watch this guy die horribly. <laughs> yes, yes, that too. <laughs> yeah, you either you either love the characters and don't want to see them harmed, or he makes you hate them so much that you you turn the page just uh-huh. to figure out what terrible thing happens to them. Uh huh. Uh huh. Or sometimes what terrible thing doesn't happen to them because sometimes this this the karma of the Stephen King universe is not kind uh-huh. sometimes. And that's the that's what's great about him because you never can tell, right? He it mm-hmm. could go either way. So you know that he ain't afraid to kill somebody that you like. So it's anything goes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Ka baby. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. So Song of Susanna. Um since this is technically a, a episode overviewing that book. And again, I promise nothing, nothing okay. to spoil uh, after that, that singular point. Uh, but I want to kind of focus on the Susanna character a little bit um, because I think in earlier episodes of the show, Matt and I had kind of commented that she's typically like the least characterized of the Cotet. She gets the least amount of time. Like mm-hmm. we've talked about the difference between them, but I really do think this book highlights her and focuses on her in a way that that we've kind of been waiting for the entire series what what do you what do you like the most about Susanna what what attracts you to her as a character I have to be honest she's probably my least favorite in the quartet so and it could because it's hard to like her when you have such a awful introduction to her right you have her as this monstrous data who's just terrible to everybody you know and and so i mean when she comes together and comes becomes Susanna and falls in love with eddie and i you know i love them together but mainly mm-hmm. because i love eddie and like i just want to see him be happy sure but i i have a hard time connecting to her because i don't always understand her motivations um and so and 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 you know where i am in song of Susanna, like i still don't know who she is yet like she's going to be revealed like something's going to happen very soon in this book that's going to reveal like who she is and what's happening but i don't really know what that is yet so sure. i can't really tell how i feel about her still um and i think you know they they make jake so instantly likable and eddie so instantly likable and, but she's gets a very odd introduction so um i'm interested to see what's going to happen with her character because i really couldn't even tell you like she could really turn out to be evil she could turn out to be nice <laughs> she could i have no idea like you know like anything goes and that's again the the exciting part of it because i don't this book is going to be such a trip that i can't imagine <laughs> what will happen i love uh, that i'm excited for you to finally get there uh, at the end of your long your long journey with all the other books it's, and but then also after that i have the marvel omnibus comics to read oh. and then the companions <laughs> as well of course of course so not done not done <laughs> yeah i mean king has always kind of Susanna's always been different from everyone else in the quartet i mean not just because she's the only woman but he's always kind of set her aside and like the, matt and i have talked about this many times throughout the series that Eddie and Jake and Roland have all been granted visions of the tower and have all been like become tower addicts in one way or another. And Susanna has always kind of stepped outside of that. She's always kind of like, you know, been on her own and and her motivation for going through this is her love for Eddie and her love for her friends. But it does make her, it does set her aside and make her different from the other ones. And, and I do think a lot of what this, this book is, is King, recognizing that whether that was an intentional choice he made throughout the books or not recognizing that and kind of okay we need to we need to spend some time with her we need to shine a spotlight on her and explore her a little bit and and the fact that he does it that through this character of mia which um you no spoilers but you will learn more about as well as you go through the the final chapters of this book um i think i i, I agree with you i would not like if, if someone put up a poll i would not click Susanna as as my favorite character in the quartet. Um, and if they if they force me to rank them, if they if they did that to me, I would probably put her near the bottom. Um, not because I don't like her, just because I love the other ones more. But mm-hmm. I will say that that this reread like really endeared me to the character on a level that I had never I'd never experienced that before. I also wonder if there's not a different framing or a different spin where where you say Detta, Odetta, Mia, Susanna. These are all in some sense. In some in some sense, the same character. Mm. Um, and if you put them all in the bag together, 
I love this quote unquote character. <laughs> but like like Detta, like <laughs> as as awful as she is, she's she's great. Like she's she's terrifying. Mia terrifying in a very different way. In fact, some of the some of the most impactful horror in the whole series to me up to this point has been Mia um creeping around in the in the swamp. Um, possibly and, eating a baby. <laughs> possibly eating a baby in the previous book, yeah. Yeah. Um and, and so like this this interesting concept of these many personalities or facets or what have you operating in the same person, it that's um it's a very fun idea, right? Mm-hmm. And and yeah, it's it's true that we don't spend that much time with like Susanna as such, but um we spend a lot of time with kind of the whole gang. Right. So I don't know. It's just a, it's a very unique kind of character. Right. That, that's that's mm-hmm. why it's hard to pin down and be like, this is what I like about Susanna. So yeah, I would I would really like to talk to somebody who who Susanna is is their favorite character and to, mm-hmm. to understand how they see her. And again, I, I haven't finished, so I don't know what happens. But, um, you know, to see if there's a different because, you know, it's it's such mm-hmm. a different character. And that's someone that like I feel like I don't maybe I don't understand correctly Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if someone could explain to me like how they see her in this different way i think it might be helpful so i guess if someone's listening and they want to talk to me about Susanna, then but don't (laughs) no spoilers please pass the 11th (laughs) chapter yeah i mean i think i think you might have to you might have to wait until you finish the series for that to to really dive into that conversation okay but no i mean i think i think that's i I would love to talk to that person as well that not again not because i don't like her but just because yeah, she she's so different from everyone else in the, in the group, and I think a lot of them, you know, I think part of it is these other three characters fall into uh, very easily to understand archetypes. Like there's Roland, and and not saying that they're not complex characters. I think all of them are, but like Eddie is a classic Stephen King character. You understand Eddie from the lens of of liking Stephen King. Jake is is this little boy who's gone through this terrible trauma and has found strength from it. So that's immediately identifiable. Um, Roland is, is Roland. Um, and then, yeah, you have Susanna who's, who's very complicated. And, and as you said, Matt, I love that framing because there's, there's literally so many different things going on inside her, um, mm-hmm. that it is not, it is not, it, it's not a easy bucket to put her in. Um, as far you as I forgot, boy, goes. by the way, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't I'm forget so sorry. Oy. I will <laughs> never forget. Oy. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously another archetype there. Um, yeah, but yeah, it, it's, I mean, and plus like, Eddie and Jake are in some sense written to be likable. Whereas I think, I think Susanna just serves a different function from the perspective of like, how are you supposed to feel about her? Well, I think you're actually supposed to feel a little wary, right? Because she does contain this risk that at any moment she could like turn into someone else and stab you in the back. Yeah. Um, So, yeah. And and, uh, King introduces the pregnancy so early and I kind of forgot how early, like, until this this reread that like the first mentions we get of Susanna is possibly pregnant is early wizard and glass and the wastelands is it is it in the way yeah i think you're right she she mentions it i just read i just read yeah yeah Yeah, with the wise old elves yeah 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 and that's so early in the series right and so like we're sitting here with this unknown inside her that we're like we don't know what this is we don't know what this could be um Mm -hmm. is this a demon from the um from the the summoning circle is this just eddie's kid and it 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 makes you wary of her in in Mm -hmm. a a little way yeah i like Mm -hmm. that i like that all right um let's see what else what do i I, i'm trying really hard to like work around i know (laughs) it's hard (laughs) um i would like i you know i really like um learning like just having the aside of roland's backstory i think like that's one of my favorite parts of it because that's that's like i just want to delve into every character as much as humanly possible Mm -hmm. like if he was to write a book just delving into any character backstory of his that he did i'd be like yep on board let's have more (laughs) you know spin off do it like um you know like stephanie meyer who did twilight she just came out with midnight sun which is twilight from edward's point of view Mm -hmm. (laughs) you probably Uh don't know about that and that's fine but um (laughs) i did not but, but but that but that idea of right like you take uh, the story and you do it from Eddie's point of view or you do it from Jake's point of view or you do it, you know, any book of his from somebody else's point of view is going to be a totally different book. Um, just a thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I love Roland's backstory stuff too. And I'm usually not like a big backstory type person, but I, I think King, I mean, basically the gunslinger is a book about 
Roland's backstory and so is Wizard and Glass. So two of the seven books in the series are are let's learn about Roland's past a little bit because like so much of the gunslinger even though it's a very short book but so much of it is stories of Roland as a youth. Um so much so we're mad I think when you first went through it you thought that this was just going to be the structure of the series that yeah. Um, I think that was one of your first predictions that say, I think the end of this desert is going to be the end of the entire series and we're just going to be flashing back. Yeah, I thought we, I thought the whole the whole thing was going to be basically a chain of flashbacks. And when when Roland ended, you know, when he got to the mountains, that was going to be the Dark Tower, uh, which is <laughs> which is quite humorous in retrospect. But yeah, it's wrong, uh, but that, it's OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but like. I, I definitely was predicting for for a while, like, well, like he's been teasing us so hard on the on the Roland backstory. There's got to be a big Roland backstory dump at some point. And, and I could hear the smile in your voice because, of course, there's a whole book, basically, that's a Roland backstory dump. <laughs> yes, um, yes, yes. But yeah. Uh, Julia, what is your what's your favorite book of the five and three quarters that you've read so far? I couldn't pick. It's it's a tough it's tough to pick. I don't it, yeah. know if I can. Like I think you know the drawing of the three is so was such a mind fuck that I wasn't expecting that that, mm-hmm. that was really something that like blew my lid off. Um, but then getting to know everybody deeper and deeper, like you can't I can't tear them away. Um, I so I just as I said just reread the wastelands. Uh, Blaine, not my favorite part of the series. Okay, I kind of am like eh, on Blaine. Uh, but I just don't like riddles in general. So <laughs> well, yeah, that I'm would, just like, that would, meh, riddles. That would make that part a little tough to read. Yeah, I, yeah. Cause like to me, they're so, un- they're always, they've always been something that vexed me. Like they're always so unsolvable to me that I'm just like, fuck it. Like I don't have the time to like think about it. I just get so like impatient. So <laughs> sorry. Well, that's, just, that's just Eddie Dean. I know. I know my, my patience has never been my greatest virtue. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I, I mean, I, they and they all build on one another, right? So like they, sure. you, you can't after a while, like I can't really separate them. They all kind of merge into one. Like if you were to ask me, like where one stops and the other one begins, it's hard to pick it out because they all kind of blend in a beautiful way. Yeah, yeah. I actually like that was that was one thing I was completely unsure of going into this this project is I ha- I've read these books multiple times, but it had been a while since I reread them, and I, I remember the plot movements and events. I did not remember which book they were part of. So <laughs> I, it was always, ve- I always had to be very careful because I didn't know, like I, I try to, I don't want to spoil Matt, but I try to like set things up and like gear a conversation if something's about to happen. But I often find that I just was wrong about which <laughs> book that, that thing appeared in. Um, so yeah, they do all kind of blend together. So, I, and I think, you know, if you'd asked Stephen King, he sees this as one story, not seven stories. So um, I think he likes it that way, and, and it feels it that, that way. way. And I can only keep my fingers crossed that some point he will uh, grace us with another chapter in this story. Yeah. I say it's possible. I don't give up my hope. Yeah. Well, you know, I that'd mean, be interesting because you he, can explore backstories. You can explore different areas. You can explore different kingdoms. You can explore whatever you want within this world. Right? It doesn't have to be like a direct yeah. whatever. I mean, he's he's done it before, so I would not yeah. be surprised. Yeah. Fingers um, crossed, please, Stephen yeah. King. <laughs> Yeah. Are, are you at all a Lord of the Rings fan, Julia? Yes, I am. And I, you know, I read them in preparation for the films coming out. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to like them more than I did. I got to be honest. Tolkien is so entranced in his own world and exploring <laughs> it to these like minute degrees. And I'm like, I don't, I don't care, man. I don't care about <laughs> this. Like, let's go. And like, he, and like the chapters are so long. That by the time like he because it splits up they split everybody up right so like mm-hmm. they have like a Merry and Pippin chapter mm-hmm. and it goes on for so long that by the, by the time they get back to Sam and Frodo I'm like I don't even remember where they are <laughs> like what has happened yeah it's so it's, it's such so to me they felt very and I know this is going to offend people I'm sorry you know because I know they're de- endearing books and I and I liked them but not enough to reread them or be but the films films I adore. They're mm-hmm. amazing. So, you mm-hmm. know, I, I am almost always of the book is better than the movie kind of person. But uh, in this one case. Sure. I, I, I'm a, I, I call myself a pretty high tier Tolkien fan. And, and I can still admit that the, the actual writing is, is pretty sterile and the actual storytelling can be um, a, a bit of a drag. I, I, I mainly asked because one of our favorite things to do on this podcast is to point out 
uh, connections between Lord of the Rings oh, yeah, and, sure. and the Dark Tower, and and what, it was one a, of your favorite things. <laughs> well, yeah, one of my favorite things is that it's they, always they do, and you you yeah. can tell that one is coming from the other, right? And yeah. so, yeah. like you know, of course, I love Lord of the Rings for what other people build upon it, right? There would be no mm-hmm. Dark Tower without Lord of the Rings, and I, of course, he's the he's an incredible I, like the imagination of Tolkien is insane, and the fact that he's come up with languages and all of these backstories and like you know, but it's. It's a different, it's a different feel. Like I don't, yeah, and I, yeah. as much as I, I know, and I did fall in love with the characters, obviously like Sam and Frodo are amazing. I love all of the characters, but the, it's just like the distraction of the world building that I would do without. Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I feel like a big thing that, and, and I'd like to hear everyone's you know thoughts on this, but, but I feel like a big thing that King is doing with the dark tower is he's saying, I'm actually going to avoid world building to the to the degree possible and just pull in ideas from other stuff that I've loved because you know Roland has a little not a speech but a remark at one point where where he's like don't people on your world eat stew and he's saying like why why are all your stories just one genre like why, why don't you tell stories that dip between genres because that's exactly what the dark tower is right king likes western sure. so he pulls a western in here he likes robots so he pulls in blaine he likes uh, fantasy, so he so he's got a, he's got wizards. He, he's he's pulling in ideas and concepts and stuff from T. S. Eliot and stuff from J. R. R. Tolkien, and he's putting it all together and processing it through his way of seeing the world and and, and character and everything, um, and having fun with that. And so, like, yeah, it's like it's radically different from something like Lord of the Rings because it's it's doing a completely different thing. Obviously, um, mm-hmm. I don't know. Do you do you? Does that make sense as like that's kind of what he's doing with the yes. Dark Tower? Yes, completely. And I think mm-hmm. that all you can really ask for in a, a creator of any sort, right? like an artist or a filmmaker or a writer is like you just want to see them in the work. Mm-hmm. And it's like if you if he's able to say like if all pick all of these things and you can tell that every reference in there is something that he dearly loves because this he knows what this this is like a master work, right? Like this is going to live forever. Like you have to if you're but these are the you know if he's saying like these are the things that influence me and now they're going to influence you and like passing on this kind of mantle of like if somebody's reading this and doesn't hasn't read lord of the rings maybe they will because of like oh okay this is kind of dark tower related or wizard of oz or like whatever you want to call it like there's going to be something connected to it that can draw you in and he can introduce you to it in a way through the dark tower like i said with westerns right like now i'm like oh i'm kind of intrigued by westerns now because now he's opened my eyes to what that is so i think that it's it's cool that it's not only this series of books but it's also these references to all these hundreds and thousands of other pop culture things that you should know about yeah oh yeah, yeah. sure like we, we we go we listen to songs we read poems because we're like i want to yeah. understand that reference exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah and and we talked about this on an earlier episode and and i'll repeat it here but like one of the things i i love the most about that is it doesn't serve as as gatekeeping like stephen king is not saying you must understand this poem to get what I'm doing in the story. What he's saying is, look how cool this poem is. Don't you want to go read this poem? And so he's, he's inviting you to appreciate more things, not telling you, you must be an appreciator of these things to understand Mm. what I'm doing in my very important work. That's not the type of person he is. And, and I love that. I love it so much. 100%. Cool. All right. Um, I want to talk to you about your project because you are also a filmmaker and yes, I am. you are making a movie right now. Um, could you, I guess, for the, the listeners, uh, all of our listeners might not know what the what the Dollar Baby yeah. program is. So could you explain what that is and, yes. and how you happened upon this? I will. So, uh, so Stephen King has a program called the Dollar Baby program, which he's had for a really long time. Uh, the famous story is that Frank Darabont uh, sent in his uh, film and Stephen King was so impressed that they became friends. And then, of course, he went on to direct uh, all the Stephen King films. Mm-hmm. So what the, what the idea is, if you can right now, you can go on stephenking.com and look it up. And there's just a, a certain amount of short stories of his that he has available. So you can buy the rights for one dollar for one year. Uh, the film has to be 45 minutes or under and it has to be nonprofit, non-broadcast. So you can't sell it or show it publicly anywhere but you can send it to film festivals and um, to private screenings uh and so he just and so you could just ask for it and so i i so my i was reading so in my dark tower quest i was reading night shift and uh so the story that i so my favorite story in night shift is i know what you need 
which is not Dark Tower related, but is fantastic. <laughs> and I really, really loved it. And it really spoke to me. And I was like, you know, how does one get rights to a Stephen King story? How does that happen? So I was like, let me go look. So I went online and like, there's the site and you're like, okay. And like, you just send it an email and then they sent me a contract back. You send Stephen King a dollar bill and there you are. So I have the rights to the story. And so I, I had really sent it in in this kind of like, there's no humanly way this was of a work kind of way. Like, mm -hmm. it's just like, a, well, you know, maybe do you have this? Could I? And then they just like immediately sent back a contract. Like, there you go. And I was like, oh, now I have to do it. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so it was this kind of really unexpected um, thing. And then I, so the story takes place at the University of Maine where Stephen King went and where the, so the story is set there. And so I contacted the University of Maine and asked if they could, if I could film there. And they said, yes. So the film uh, will be shot in the exact locations referenced in the story. So like it opens in a library and like the library mm -hmm. will be the library he meant when he wrote that's, it. So it's awesome. like the const most constant reader, -y, constant reader thing of all time. And I'm so excited. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. I, I love that he does this program and, and it's very exciting that you get to make this, this film. Um, I, I don't want to spoil, I know what you need for people. So we won't get okay. into, to, to details about that just in case people haven't read it and I don't want to spoil them on it. But, um, so you're, are you, I, I think I saw actually just, just before we got on the phone, you're in pre-production on this movie now. Yes. So, um, so I have, I adapt, I adapted the script myself, okay. uh, which was tricky because you don't, you know, I want it to remain as Stephen King as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also you, I, there was like different, I had to write like transition scenes and stuff. So like putting my words into his story, which is insane to do and made me feel crazy. <laughs> sure. And then when I had people read the script, I was like, can you tell which parts are mine? And they were like, no. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Oh, sure. Does yeah. mine like blaringly stand out is terrible. Mm -hmm. um, so then, yes. Yeah, so I did, what I decided to do was to do an Indiegogo campaign, which uh, went well and we got a good amount of money. And so now it's just taking the next steps of uh, getting, I have a cameraman, uh, Alex Simon, who's great. He shot my documentary out of print. And my brother, Peter Marchesi, did the music for Out of Print as well as doing the music for this. Uh, but I'm crewing up and I have to find my cast. So I know what you need is a very intimate story. And there's only mm -hmm. three main characters. So it's really about finding the three right people for this to work. It hinges on that um, mainly. Uh, and then it's getting everyone together for... So it would be uh, shooting next summer in Maine. Okay. So getting everything together there. Um, and it's actually really cool because when I was, so I went to Maine last autumn because uh, I'd never been there and I wanted to take this like pilgrimage to Maine and visit all these, you know, Bangor and Pownal and all these places I'd read about. Mm -hmm. So I took a tour in Bangor with SK Tours and they were amazing. It was so cool. I was like, I was so happy. It was like walking through his novels because like Derry's geography is basically Bangor's geography. So you can walk through the barrens and the canals and the Paul Bunyan statue and like the standpipe yeah. and the whole, it's all there. And so I was like, so incredibly happy. So, um, I, they're going to be helping me, uh, with getting people out, uh, crew out there in Maine as well. So I want to be able to ho ha hire some local crew, um, there. And I'm so happy because it's, it's, you know, the thought of I'm going to make a short film of my very favorite story by my very favorite author. That's bananas. Like how yeah. did that happen? I'm so, I'm so excited. So it's just this. And, and so I am still uh, accepting donations as well. So we did uh, raise okay. some of the money, but not all of the money. So it's still being funded and we will go from what we have. Yeah. So the, the Indiegogo campaign is, is, close now so if yes. someone wants if someone listening to this one of our our listeners that didn't notice that campaign or didn't see it and wants to donate to make this happen um where can they go uh, if you just uh message me on my instagram or my facebook or my twitter uh okay i will respond to you i am very we good will, about it we will link those in the show notes for our listeners so if okay, you want to cool. reach out to julia yeah yeah it's awesome. really it's a dream come true and it's something that you know in 2020 gives me something to hope for something to <laughs> sure. look forward to, you know, something yeah. like I'm really excited about. Um, and I was, I was kind of nervous about launching the campaign in the middle of all of this, but I felt like I have a year contract and if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. And I would feel so stupid if I, if I passed up this opportunity, to, like I have to at least give it my best shot. Yeah. Yeah. So d d does the way the contract worked is like the film has to be wrapped and, and done final cut and everything. Like it's got to be done, done or how does that work? Yes. Gotta okay. be done, done. All right. 
Um, but they, but that being said, they did give me an extension. So okay, yeah. Considering the times we we live in right <laughs> yeah, now, yeah, exactly. I was like, uh, I couldn't <laughs> do it this year because pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, well, hopefully by the time we get to next summer, um, things will have gone relatively back to that's normal. That's what I'm hoping, yes. And I, w- I would really um, encourage everybody to read the story because it's a very, I'm not going to spoil anything, but it is a very unique feel to his, his. it's a very unique story. I feel like it, it, it is very low key for Stephen King and mm-hmm. it's, I like that about it. And I like that it was first published in Cosmopolitan Magazine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because like you feel like is that something that like he wrote this for a female audience, or was this something that he had a story and then he just sent it in? And that's what they happened to pick. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Because um, it has a female main character and, and like a young female main character that so it feels like something that he could have been tailoring towards that audience, but I can't say. Yeah, it's so wild to me that like one of the one of the critiques I see most often by non constant readers is that Stephen King doesn't write women very well. And like, I think there are certainly cases where that is true, but it's so wild to me. Like his first novel was like about like it, Carrie is his first book. And then he, I, I think that's a really great perspective of, of a woman as well. So I, I, I kind of push back whenever I see that. I mean, I'm I'm a dude, so like, I, I don't want to push back too hard because what do I know? But um, I, I do think like that's an unfair stereotype that gets he gets, gets thrown at him sometimes. Well, and I, I, I agree. And I, I think that I'm excited to take this on because you have this female character who's written by a male who's now going to be directed and adapted by a female. Yeah. How yeah. is that going to change? And of course, like my vision of the story I think is very unique and not what anybody else, how anybody else sees the story. Like I see it in a totally sure. different weird way. And so it's, it'll be cool to show it like, and that's what, I think that's, what's cool about Stephen King movies. And like when you have different versions of the same story, um, you know, the t- different it versions, the different pet cemeteries or whatever. And like you have the same source material, but somebody's seeing this story in a different way. And yeah. this is like their version of it. And I think that's really cool. And then there's, you know, with all the dollar babies, like there's a lot of different versions of the same story and they're all completely different because it's just seeing it through that filmmaker's eyes. It's it's such a cool program. I, I love it. I mean, for someone who has had as much success with getting adaptations of his stuff in general, the fact that he's still like setting stuff aside and being like, no, no, no we're going to we're going to leave this stuff up to, to people out there because I, Stephen King, just want to see what people come up with. I think yeah, that, that shows and his love of storytelling. That's the absolute kicker, right? Like he doesn't have to do this program at all, but he yeah. does it. Not only is he giving people a chance to adopt his story for a dollar, which is crazy, but mm-hmm. then also part of the contract is you have to send him a finished copy of your film. <laughs> because he wants to see what everybody does and how everybody interprets his work. So even after all these years, like he doesn't have to do that. Of course he doesn't, but like he generally is still curious. That's what a that's cool so guy. Wonderful. Yeah. I love you, Stephen King. <laughs> He's so great. He's so great. I love him. Matt, we'll have to make a, I think once we're done with this whole project, we'll, we'll set aside some time and we'll make a, a co-pilgrimage to Maine. Um, yeah. I, I, I just picked out all, all of, you know, the the SK tours really jumped yeah. out at me. Oh, I was like, wait a yeah, like so a, good. It's like yeah. a whole company that that does Stephen King tours. It makes sense. Yeah. Like he's he's a phenomenon. But uh, that's yeah. That's so yeah. Funny there was a there was a really embarrassing moment on my tour because I was like. I was the first one on the bus that day and I was hopping up and down in my seat like a little <laughs> kid. And we were um so we were in the pet cemetery cemetery and then the bus turns the corner and there's flags, the store, right? That the store that he takes the name from. Uh-huh. And so I see the sign and I just blurted out completely involuntarily, flags, <laughs> like at the top of my voice and then clapped my hands over my mouth because I realized what an idiot I am. And he was like, yeah, we're going to get there. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm sorry, you guys. <laughs> I can't help it. There's yeah. flags. There it is. Holy yeah, shit. I, Bangor. I, I, I've never done the tour and I've always wanted to. So that's definitely something once the the world returns to normal mm. that I'd love and to it, do. It is a, it is a gorgeous state. Absolutely. And I, yeah. you know, and I drove around, I had the like overlay map of where Castle Rock and Derry are and like tried to like go near there and see what it was like. And I, so I stayed in Portland and I stayed in Bangor and then I spent, I was like, well, I have to spend one night in like a tiny town because this is what Stephen King is, right? Like the evil yeah. lurks underneath tiny towns. So I picked this tiny town that was halfway between Castle Rock and Derry and I went there. And so it was like this so small that it only has like one main street, like one block <laughs> and that's like it. And there was, it was a Sunday night and the place I had booked was above a, bre- a brewery. 
it was a really cool place. But I, there was only one place open across the street, a Chinese restaurant. And I realized that once that was closed, I was going to be completely alone. There would be nobody. And I was like, Man. oh, no, I've made a terrible <laughs> mistake. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> but it turned out to be fine. And I started doing the storyboards for I Know What You Need there. So it was all oh, good. Wow. That's wonderful. Unless they actually, he actually like body swapped me there. And <laughs> something happened that I don't know about. You never know. Yeah. You never know. It, it could happen. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I've said on the show that I live in Castle Rock, Colorado. So you do, yeah. That's, do you that's really? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. you lucky duck. I know. I bet I you, know. There's like t-shirts and like stuff aplenty with Castle Rock all over it. We, I mean, there is, but but not because of the Stephen King reference. I think people... No, of here, course, but yeah, you can just yeah. use it for that yeah. in your own brain, sure. right? Sure, yeah. sure. I, I think I, I went and visited you there a few years ago, and it was before we started this. And I was like, "Do you not realize how cool this is?" And <laughs> well, you didn't. You didn't at the time. You well, didn't here's the thing. It. I mean, here's the thing. You're you're saying we should go on this tour. I'm like, "Yeah, that sounds fun," but I haven't read it. I haven't read any of these books. I wouldn't know yeah. the references. So, well, like, yeah, I that's need. Why- We'll yeah. do that first, yes. and then and then we'll go on the tour. Yeah. Yes, you definitely have to read it before you go because it is like walking through that novel, and it is because he will actually yeah. point out there's Beverly's house, there's Bill's house, <laughs> like there they are, and I'm like, oh my god, dying. Yeah, That's yeah. Great. It, it, I think, I think my favorites change constantly, but I think it is just my favorite Stephen King book, and um, it is also the one that we get the most emails from listeners about covering one day. They're like, you gotta, you guys gotta give it this treatment because I want to hear Matt experience this book. So yeah, I think definitely. we'll probably end up doing that. It's not like it's, it's, it's related to the dark tower. Yeah. It's not, not related, but it's one of, it's one of the further levels out. Um, it's not like as directly related. Yeah. But. The problem with me is, is like I have, uh, you know, n- next up I'm going to read either the shining or it or pet cemetery or the stand. <laughs> one of these four, Absolutely no way of breaking this tie. Um, sure, so sure. You're just gonna have to pick it, for me. It, it, okay, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. There that it is. is my. That is my. <laughs> it has been decreed by Julia Marchesi. You cannot go back now. Okay. Well, yeah. That was easy. There you go. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Okay, uh, before we go, I, I wanted to talk to you about your other movie because this this short that you're making is not the first movie that you've made. You, you mentioned earlier you made, you made a documentary film a few years ago called Out of Print, and I watched it in preparation for uh, meeting you. Oh, that's awesome. And, and I, I just wanted to – I just since I have you here on the phone, I wanted to get to talk to you about this because um, the documentary is about rep screenings and specifically about the New Beverly, uh, a, a rep theater out in, in L.A. Um, and I, I watching this movie in 2020 was very strange to me because, like, theaters have been closed since March. And I just wanted to talk to you about, like, since you made that movie, there's been a lot of changes in, in – theaters in general in the the uptick of streaming i think it was 2014 when you made that right i think yeah um so like the the industry has changed again and then this whole big thing comes along so i mean what's your what's your view on theaters and screenings and and life in 2020 now like do you do you see a future for this stuff after we get through this i have to say yes because I mean, honestly, the the movie theaters being closed is what's broken my heart the most about this and like how I see mm-hmm. it's going to affect it and especially the indie theaters, which are my favorite. Um, so I, it breaks my heart because I know it's going to have a terrible repercussion. And, and I think, as you can probably tell through my passion in the film, you know, my heart lies in watching films with an audience. Yeah. Um, and especially horror movies, right? Because watching horror movies with 100, 200 people all being scared at the same time is what they're made for. So, you know, I've been watching movies here, at, you know, at my apartment, but it's not the same. You know, it really isn't. Like I just watched, I don't know if you've ever seen Blood Diner. It's crazy. And it, but it's made to be like a midnight movie. And I was like, if I was watching this with 200 people, it would be a completely different film. But because I'm sitting in my apartment by myself, it seems flat. But it's not the film's fault at all. It's just like it's made to be seen with people. So I, you know, I want these theaters to be opened up as soon as possible desperately because I just don't want them to die any more than they already were because I think it's such an important part of culture to humanity is to be watching these things with other people that has to keep going. That's part of what humans do is we just like to be around other humans. So I know that it's going to be nervous making for the next couple of years, but it's just something that people need to support. And that's something that I've been donating to theaters all over the country this whole time, because I'm like, please, please don't, don't go anywhere because they're so important. And I just don't want people to 
not support them and let them go because they're so important. But, you know, obviously you see in my film, like I'm also was also fighting for 35 millimeter, which is something that was dying. Right. So they get something that I, you know, I'm so afraid of things being forgotten and I just don't want them to go without a, you know, without somebody saying, Hey, look how important this is. So, you know, do I think movie theaters are dead? No, not at all. I think they're totally going to come back and we'll be fine, but it's going to be scary. And I think it's going to be different. And like, those are the things that, when the pandemic first started, like I could loop forward and see what the repercussions are. And I'm like, I just don't want this. I don't want people to be afraid to be around other people. Like that's just going to change yeah. what humanity is. And I'm like, I please don't let that happen. So I don't know it's happening now, but I don't know, you know, I'm hoping it will be temporary. We can get back to normal hugging. Oh, I miss hugs so bad. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. I miss hugs so bad. Like I just want, and that's the thing is like, I've, you know, as a horror movie junkie have envisioned a billion apocalyptic scenarios in my head, but I have never thought of one where movie theaters and hugs were taken away from me. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Come on. Yeah. yeah, I mean, watching your movie was, it, it was definitely an experience because, I mean, on the one hand, it depressed me to no end because, like, I was watching these people talk lovingly about this experience that they, at the time, were like, we're never going to go six months without this experience. I can just walk out my door and walk to the local theater and see a, a double screening whenever I want. And, like, but on the other hand, like it, it made me so happy because like I was remembering these fond times that I have. And then I have Dallas has nothing like the new Beverly. I don't think very many places have anything like the new Beverly. And I've I've been there once when I visited L.A. years ago. But um, that's really my only experience with it. But we do have smaller independent theaters that I, I visit a lot and I've missed it so much. So it's kind of like living vicariously through your movie. And it was I I was sad and it made me very happy at the same time. It was an interesting experience to watch this year. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, I feel like I completely agree because it's it's different for me as well because I don't you know I don't work there anymore. So like looking mm -hmm. back at it at this time and place, and it was a time capsule because if you go to the people who watch out of print now expect to go to it to the theater and have it be like it is in the film and it's not right. anymore it's totally different now it, it's so it's a different feeling and a different kind of audience um i haven't been back so i don't know the difference but a lot of people say it's like a kind of a more less about the film more about the cool factor kind of crowd mm -hmm. yeah um so it kind of has shifted in that way where you know it used to be about like the weirdos and now it's kind of more about the cool kids um, so it, but I love that it's a, it's a time capsule of that place. Like this was this, you know, this time period that I experienced it at. And like, this is what I saw. And again, it's the theater through my experience. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, so it's not how anybody else experiences it, but this, this is how I saw this theater in this wonderful place. And I think that one of the things that delights me most is when people see the film is that they say that it's like you, it's like Julia in film form. I'm like, <laughs> it is. Like, you know, all the little like snipes, those little drive in like cartoon stuff, like and all the grooviness, like that's all very me. <laughs> um, and, you know, and the New Beverly was very me, um, sure. just that kind of feeling. And I think it's very goes a lot against that, like Stephen King, everybody's an outsider kind of idea, because that's what the New Beverly was for. It's like all these outsiders who could come together and be outsiders together and like it wasn't that fun you know it wasn't that a cool yeah. thing um but I, i'm happy that the film you know i got to sh shoot half on digital and half on film i got to have a 35 millimeter print of the film made which now lives in the academy archives so yeah you know and it's played all around the world in the kind of places that it should have played at you know all the little art house cinemas and film archives and universities and stuff so even though the film is kind of strange to watch because it's a time and place that's gone it's also nice that it's you know, even you touched some touched you in a way where you think, like, oh, you thought about your experiences, and like that's mm -hmm. what it's for. It's for you to remember your great experiences, and also to remember to support those places that gave you those experiences. Yeah, and you got to interview like a whole bunch of great people. I was yeah. kind of, I was you kind wanna, of you want there's somebody there's somebody you want to ask me about, isn't there? Who do you want to uh, ask me about? No, nah, you can I don't ask me about to. anybody we, you want. I'll tell you about. It. Nah, I will tell fine. you every everybody who I interviewed was an absolute delight. Everybody was super cool. Um. And it was great to just hear everybody's thoughts on on it. And, you know, everybody I talked to was so eloquent and really put their thoughts out in a really cool way um, that it, I, you know, and I think that it's, I think that everybody's kind of different personalities come through and you, you know, I think that I, I'm happy that I feel like the interviews feel very casual yeah, um, yeah, and that, you know, it's not like a stiff kind of thing. It's just kind of people talking, but that's because I had interviewed 
think everybody in the film before at the New Beverly. Mm -hmm. So some of them one time, some of them multiple times. And so they had, we had already kind of known each other. And I think that really helped. And I always try, cause I did a, a, so many Q and A's at the New Beverly with people. And I always tried to make it that casual feeling. Cause it's just like, you want to hang out and learn about these cool things, but not make it stiff and awkward. You wanted to make it like, Oh, let's just have a conversation. And when, and when you make it like that, people are more prone to kind of open up a little bit more and tell you, more things because it, it is a safer environment. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I, it was like the interviews were wonderful. Like I, when the, the, the movie opens with you just listing all the people that are going to appear in the movie. And I was like literally saying, holy shit to myself. As I, went through <laughs> it. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, you got yeah, some, I, some really great folks I, in there. Yes. And I, I can, I, I mean, again, happily report that everybody, everybody I talked to is awesome. Um, I, you know, I had very few, into encounters with people in at the New Beverly who weren't so pretty much everybody was cool um I, it's I, kind of it's kind of this weird thing where like if you are famous you're really cool but if mm-hmm. you were famous you're not so cool because <laughs> then you're like trying to like hang on to the fame you had and like show that you were famous and then it's kind of weird sure and um, okay. as the uncool person here maybe just for for people like me what is what is the Beverly exactly um, so the New Beverly Cinema is a theater in Los Angeles. It's been there since 1978, and they show double features on film. And so it's known for being like a place for the weirdos to hang out and all the real big hardcore film geeks. And it's super cheap, and it's uh, you know any kind of genre, any you know. And so it, it switches every two days. So there'll be three shows a week of different stuff, plus midnight movies and everything. Um, and then when I was there, we were doing a guest programming series where we'd have directors come in and program a week of their favorite films, and then talk about how those films influence their work. So we had Edgar Wright and Ryan Johnson and Stuart Gordon and Joe Dante and Pat Oswald and Seth Green and all of these guys come do this. And they came every night and they talked about that film and you know, how specifically or what to look out for before the film. Like, oh, these are the shots I really like or like look out for this thing. And so it became this like mecca for the film nerds. And um, then the owner died and there was a transfer of power. So now it is run by Quentin Tarantino. So he owns the theater completely. And all the films that he shows are from his personal 35 millimeter collection, which is, as you can imagine, very extensive. Um, so, but, but when that change happened, um, yeah, the people say it was a, a kind of a different thing going on, but again, I haven't been back, so I don't know. Yeah. And that actually happened. Like, I think it happened in 2014, right? So like, where he where he assumed full control so it like happened right after your movie came out um, it was during that yeah oh wow oh wow. Uh, that was happening um yeah, yeah so of course there's behind the scenes stuff that you know i'm not going to talk to you about but i will sure, tell you that sure. there was some behind the scenes stuff yeah sure it just sounds like the coolest thing in the world for for film people and and you know the it, a, a, yeah, a director's it, cinema yeah, definitely. And, it, you know, and I was the happiest clam in the world to be there for that time. And it really felt like home and a place where I'd been looking for, you know, like, this is the kind of place I want to hang out at. And these are the people I want to hang out with and feel like I'm part of something underground, even though it's not sure. uh, in a way. Yeah. Um, but I've always, been, you know, I've always been super, you know, I, it's also weird that, you know, I was a, there's not a lot, there were never a lot of girls there. <laughs> like it was always like 90% guys. So it was like the only place you go where there's like a line around the corner for the guys room, but like nothing yeah. for the girls room. And I was always so confused by it. Cause I'm like, where are the other me's? There's gotta be them out there. Like I'm hardcore. I'll watch fucking anything. I love it. <laughs> Cannibal Holocaust, bring it on. Like, let's do it. You know? And like, it's so it's a very weird dynamic of like, I don't know why that kind of hardcore film geek tends to skew more male. I don't know yeah. if you have any. That's a weird thing to bring up now. It has nothing to do with Stephen King, but here we are. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think we're we're off the off the track pretty far now, and that's okay. I I go to a genre film festival in Austin every year called Fantastic Fest, and uh-huh, it's, I know it. it's the same the same thing. Like the the bathroom line for the for the men what is, is that? way longer. Well, I don't get it. I don't know. I, I, it's just the that kind of genre film fan tends to be dudes. I don't know why. I don't know. Well, I just, I'm just a gore hound though, you know, like really mm-hmm. you can show me pretty much anything and I'm, I'm good with it. But you know, cause like, so 
I have a podcast horror movie survival guide and like the whole idea is like how do you survive a horror film and so we like we, and this is the idea like you look at the final girl and you're like okay look what steps can you take to make sure that because you know that's the whole idea about horror movie we're like how do you survive and I my best friend and I were like well if you watch enough horror movies you'll learn how to survive so if anything happens to you you've like have this backlog of things you can pull from in like a Randy from Scream kind of way where you have this like back catalog like that uh, that's right, fun right yeah. So, you know, it's me and my best friend, Terry, who we talk about a horror movie every week and like deep dive into it. And like, it's anything goes, any kind of genre, any kind of like as hardcore as you want to get. And we're on there. And I love it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I think I think that's all I wanted to talk to you about. I'm sorry, we we went off the Stephen King topic. So sorry, Matt. And sorry, everyone listening out there, if you didn't want to hear about. You shouldn't be uh, sorry. You no. should be excited. We had this exciting conversation and you've been enthralled this entire time, listener. I know yeah. you have been. I have yes. faith in you. I agree. I, I was enthralled the entire time. Sure. And that's all that I yeah. care about. No, I mean, I learned, <laughs> I, I learned a lot of interesting things about this, this cool f- film scene that I, I wish I knew more about. Um, yeah. But I, I don't. But that's okay. I'm sure. I, I can I'm grow. Sure Denver you, you meet has a revival house. Matt, I'm sure they have one. Yeah, the yeah. Denver, uh, they do. Um, out of print played it. One that I'm blanking on. Um but yeah, there's uh, there's a couple in Denver. Colorado's mm-hmm. cool, man. Castle Rock, you lucky, lucky duck. I know, <laughs> man. I know. I, I'd be I, so excited to live in Castle Rock. I, I've got to, I've got to earn that luck, you know. Got to. Yeah, yeah. You'll gotta, get there. Yeah. We're, slowly, Matt. Every week, you get a little <laughs> bit closer. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, that's that, that's the problem, actually. There's Castle a Rock can be Castle Rock can be your de- your tower. That's what you're working towards. <laughs> and when yes. you fully under when you fully understand Castle Rock, then you will understand yourself. Okay. Perfect. Wow. This is became very large in scope suddenly. I'm, yeah. This is what I do. Yeah. This is great. <laughs> I drop in your life and I'm like, read it. Uh and also I've figured out the purpose of your life. So you're welcome. Yeah. yeah. Boom. There you go, uh, Matt. Reeling over here. julia thank you so much thank you this was such a fun conversation i really appreciate you taking the time i had a blast this is awesome i will literally talk about stephen king for as long as you want any old time my friends yeah well we would love love to have you back sometime to talk more stephen king maybe after you finished (laughs) chapter 11 of song of susanna maybe yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. let's talk to me after that and then i'll I'll have a whole different perspective on everything i'm sure uh-huh. Yeah, All right. yeah, absolutely. So people can can check out your work on Horror Movie Survival Guide, the podcast you talked about. That's available everywhere, right? Yeah. Um, and they can also see your your film out of print. Uh, I watched it on Tubi, but I think it's I think it's available just about anywhere you can rent movies. Yeah. Right? It's pretty. It's on VOD pretty much everywhere. Amazon Prime as well. If you and it, I just came out on the Amazon Prime in the UK as well. Awesome. So it's there, and I'm on tw- uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram as Julia C Marquesi. And I love to hear from people, especially if you want to talk to me about Stephen King, because I am on board with that. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. And if you want to help Julia with uh, her her baby dollar film or dollar baby, I said baby dollar, whatever, um, <laughs> you can also reach out to her on those, yes, please. those platforms. If you, yeah. and, and the, I mean, this is the thing, right? Like you, you know, at the end of the day, this film will be seen by Stephen King. So you have the opportunity to have your name on a film that Stephen King will watch. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. He's going to see your he'll, name. He'll be the yes. producer of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> be like, I produced a Stephen King movie and you'll be telling the truth. Pretty yeah. dope. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, You just convinced me. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, gentlemen. I, I can, can I wish you long days and pleasant nights? Is that allowed? Yeah, it is always yes. allowed. And may you have twice the number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Matt, now that that's done with, it is time to open up that mailbag and answer some questions. As I said at the top of the show, we've got a bunch, a bunch of questions. So instead of doing our normal overview ep- thing where we talk about the, 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 the book generally, we're just going to use the mailbag as kind of a jumping off point to talk about the book because there's just so many questions. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, think, I think we'll have no trouble fitting in our general discussion here. No, not at all. And we are going to start with the very first question by listener Darian Tiros, who asks, how excited, nervous, or whatever feelings you're feeling are you to go into the final book? Scott, knowing everything that comes next and how it may or may not be received by your co-host, and Matt, walking into the vast unknown that is the enormous finale of a series you seem to come to thoroughly love. Um, I'll answer my part first, and then I'll let you go, Matt. 
Sure. Uh, I am. I I was so nervous going into the series how Matt was going to uh, receive it. So so nervous. I had no idea. I loved it. I I think I know you pretty well, Matt. So I thought you would love it, um, but I just wasn't sure. And my nerves are not entirely gone. <laughs> there are still there are there are things that happen in this final book that uh, are. I'm not going to say controversial, but divisive amongst readers. So mm-hmm. I, I think there is, it is very possible that there are events of this final book that are not going to work on you and you're not going to like, um, I, I would be surprised at this point because you've been kind of along for the ride, but, uh, you know, never say never. Um, but so I, I still have some nerves, but I'm just excited at this point. I'm just excited. This is, uh, folks don't know that Matt and I, have been planning to do this show for a long time for over a year before we actually started doing it we were planning it and i was doing work in the background to kind of structure it and plan it and and reread the entire series which didn't actually happen but i i wanted it to happen but i got busy with other stuff but i was doing a lot of planning behind the scenes and kind of figuring out what it was going to be and how it was going to work and i i read through the entirety of uh, the dark tower uh, concordance by robin firth as like like which is like an encyclopedia matt it's not like a fun read but there's a lot of information in there i just wanted to make sure that i i uh was up on and 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 had quick recall on so in case something came up in the middle of the show i didn't have to pull out my book and flip through it i could could just know it um so this is kind of like this book is the culmination of all that planning and we've still got plenty of show left to do right this this final book is huge we're going to be on book seven until February. And then even after book seven, we have to talk about the wind through the keyhole and we have to talk about some of the short stories. So it's not like the podcast is coming to an end anytime soon, but we're about to, we're about to cross a threshold and, and start on the final book. And I'm just excited. I'm just ready to go. I'm just, I'm pumped. So how about you? What, what are are your thoughts? What are your feelings going into this final book? Yeah. Excited was the word that I thought of as you were reading the question before you gave your answer. So I'm, I'm just excited. I mean, I, I think people probably maybe see this by now if they've listened to this podcast and maybe if they listen to the doof cast, but like, I don't generally like watch or, or read stuff with, with the attitude of like, how, how is this serving me? It's more like, for me, it's more like uh, even if like the first thing that happens in the Dark Tower book is like everyone dies, then at least I, I would be I, I would be like, that's so interesting. Why would he do that? Right. <laughs> but like like it might like it might be like dramatically not functional in the sense of like, huh, I don't I don't get it. But like I, I'd still I'd still want to talk about it and, and understand it. Right. So like, sure, I'm just I don't think I'm just the kind of reader who's going to be like. Ah, I'm so angry at the way this went. You know, I, I, I don't know. It's possible that, you know, the book could surprise me, but I just, sure. it's, I'm, I'm mainly, I'm just, I'm just kind of excited to, you've told me it's weird. Um, I, I, I know, I know almost nothing about anything past this point. I, I, I yeah. think, yeah. I think so. you, you went into this series. The one thing you knew was that Stephen King was eventually a character and, yeah. and you did not know to the you did not know the level to which he was going to be a character but you knew he appeared in the book somehow but we've passed that part now so like you don't even have anything you're like waiting to happen i think you took that knowledge into the series and we're like waiting for that moment to happen now we've passed it and so now all bets are off Mm -hmm. um and i I think there's going to be i think like 40 people asked you to predict how the series ends so we're going to get to that question and we're going to see what you come up with but um i think it's it's really cool that we're kind of uh, un un unmapped territory here we have no idea what's gonna happen yeah. and i have a very difficult time making concrete predictions because he's taken us to this very strange place sure, um, sure. storytelling wise i think i'm the most excited to see what this book's like what this book looks like to me in this deep dive i, I talked last week about how much i how much more i fell in love with song of Susanna as a book um after experiencing it the way we did it and how much more the character of me i fell in love with after after really spending the time with her and that was not something i expected that was not something i predicted going into this this whole thing so i'm just really pumped to see what what treasures book seven has for me that i haven't even considered yet um and so it's i'm just uh, i'm so ready i'm so ready sure yeah i mean um 
I mean, I can relate to that because doing doing the podcast on Worm that we did, where I was in your seat and you were in mine, I it was it was almost an entirely new experience. Like mm-hmm. not just the rereading, but the rereading and the talking and the analyzing and the and the slow grind on on you know individual lines and it really you know like you said you find gems that you never realized were there. So. Yeah, and I mean, in, in just normal like casual for fun reading you just you just move on so quickly like i read so much and i read so many books and i i I finish a book and i open the next one that you just you don't really have time for reflection and and thinking too hard about things like it's not saying i don't think about any of the books i read but just not on this level and and this this forces me to do stuff that uh, i I had never done before of course just loving it yeah all right next question from bricks the the uh, bricks asks you guys keep teasing maybe doing more tower verse books after finishing the main dark tower series will you please make an announcement soon i'm dying <laughs> for the anticipation and the dread of having to go through 2021 with no scott and matt discussing psyching well um i guess the first thing we'll say is you're at least going to make it through the end of april 2021 because that's when everything we have planned right now comes to an end so we'll give you a quarter um we have talked about doing a season two. We have talked about like doing, um, and in our conversation with Julia that just happened, Matt just was told that he has to read it. So we have to do that now. Uh Um, so we do have plans to do stuff after this. We haven't made an official announcement yet because we're still working behind the scenes on what that schedule will look like. Um, the thing, like I would love to do a weekly show about Stephen King for the rest of my life, and I would not bat my eyes about that at all. Um, but we also have a bunch of other stuff we want to do. We we have all these plans for 2021 that uh, I think people that that care will be uh will be hearing about soon. I mean, Matt has a an audio drama show that he's been working on all year. Uh, the writing for and he's getting close to finishing up with that so we're going to head into into production on that pretty soon and that's going to take up a lot of our time so we don't want to commit to something like our our big thing our big thing is if we're going to commit to something we want to make sure we can do it because we hate we hate committing to things and then not following through so before we commit to exactly what season two of Kingslingers will look like, we want to make sure we have the bandwidth. We want to make sure we have the the time because we both have full-time jobs. Um, Matt's a parent. I'm going to be a parent in March. Uh, so we just want to make sure. Um, but I can say with a reasonable amount of certainty that we will be talking about more Stephen King stuff after the Dark Tower has ended. Yeah, in some form, in some form. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Anything else you wanted to add there, Matt? I think that's. Um, I think I covered that. Yeah, I, I think that's it. I mean, just kind of like it. It may not necessarily be a weekly thing. It may be a less frequent thing. Um, yeah. But I really, we really can't say at this point. Yeah, yeah. It's, We're still looking yeah. into it. Yeah. All right. Megafire Seven asks: So, if Stephen King is canonically the author of the Dark Tower series, and Stephen King canonically died in 1999, then what the hell did I just read? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Yeah. I. I mean, if I can just briefly address this, like, like it, it really it creates two possibilities that I can think of. One of which is that they have to somehow change the timeline to save Stephen King, and that's a plot point, or that this universe that the story is taking place in is not our universe. And 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 I, f- I feel like there's a, I feel like there may be more possibilities, but I can't pin them down in in so many words. Uh, but that's kind of where my head is right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, Megafire goes on to say on a more serious note with only one book to go, this is the last opportunity to predict what directions our characters are going in. They say, I think you are pretty on the mark with Jake, not handling the trauma of the last book very well, Matt. So what does that mean for him going forward? I guess, Matt, where do you see Jake's arc ending in book seven? I mean, I'm, I'm hoping very much that it, that it's not just Jake uh, follows through the the path of of young roland of becoming traumatized losing people he loves becoming hardened and um you know just just kind of the be, be, i don't want jake to become the kind of person who would then let a kid fall off of a bridge to achieve his his mission i okay. want i want that to be averted that that happening to me would be like the the tragic sad ending of the series um and so yeah like i i I think that we're going to play with the drama of that potentially we're going to we're going to have you know the moments of you know 
is, is Jake basically becoming a monster? Um, and, and maybe we'll go in that direction and explore that, but I, I really don't want that to happen. It, it all depends on what tone the, the series is ultimately going to leave you with. Like, is this mm-hmm. a, is this an epic tragedy or, or what exactly? And that's what we don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, but what do you, what do you think? Like, I know you don't I, want it to happen, well, but do well, you think it's going to happen anyway? I mean, if I'm, no, I don't, I, I don't, I think he will, I think it will be a positive arc for him. I think he will avoid that. And I think that he will avoid that, you know, because Roland won't let it happen. Maybe I, I don't know exactly. Okay, I don't know, but I, I don't think he's going to become, you know, uh, uh, I, like I feel like there's a word for it, but like, you know, the the, the tragic um, consequence of of Roland is that he just replicates himself, and now there's Roland two is is just who Jake is. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay, cool. All right. So, uh, next. Sorry, question. passes his trauma on is the phrase that I was looking for. Yes. Ah, ah, gotcha. Um, yes. Next question. Fast Randall says, "I'm currently working through the Black House audiobook, and it is narrated by the legend himself, Frank Muller. I don't know about you two, but his voice has a very specific way of sticking in my head, especially with the way Stephen King use, uses repetition. I can't him. To, I, I can't get him saying Abala Abala out of my head." Matt, do you have a particular phrase from the Dark Tower that Muller or, or Guidal repeat over and over again in your brain? And for both of you, what is a voice from TV, podcasts, audiobooks, etc. that always seems to pop in your heads? Uh, question mark. <laughs> uh, keep up the good, the awesome job. Thank you. The pot is a real treat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I mean, what's funny is I still like, e- even though I'm like a couple of books into Guidal's uh, readership, I still like like it, Eddie's voice in my head is Muller's voice, mm-hmm. um, and and really pretty pretty much the same for the other characters as well. Um, he just he just nails it so hard. Um, it's specific specific phrases, um, um, st- like stuff like the way he does certain voices really sticks with me. So like the way, like like the way Blaine says certain things, or like the way. Um, the man in black says like gunslinger with like, I, I can't replicate it cause I'm not, <laughs> not, but, but like, yeah, just certain, certain words and phrases from characters that have unique voices like Blaine or, or, or the man in black, I would say. When, when we finished uh wizard and glass, I think one of the ones you said that really got, got to you was the repetition of miss. Oh, so young and pretty. Has that kind of mm-hmm. stayed with you once we moved on or has, has that kind of fallen off? Well, that, yeah, I would say it's fallen off just because I can't think of any instances in my daily life when that when that would happen. But like, sure. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I hope say not. I hope not. You're not like yeah. walking through walking through your day and seeing women and like, oh, no. miss. Oh, so young and pretty. No, I'll, I have I've taught <laughs> I've basically made it a meme between me and my oldest daughter that that uh, we say thank you side to each other <laughs> um, instead of thank you. Um, I love it, it. Just as like a cute thing that we do. And I told her like, yeah, it's from a book. It's from the it's from the Stephen King book that I'm doing the podcast on, and it, like that's all the information she needs. It's just a fun, cute thing. So it's wonderful. Um, yeah, I don't know. What about you? I, I guess you're not doing the audio books. Do you have any any voices from? I mean, <laughs> like I'm 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 that person who always has a Simpsons quote for every occasion. I, I may not say them because as I've gotten older, I've realized people don't necessarily think that it's hilarious. Yeah. To quote the Simpsons all the time, but like I, I always have that voice in my head. What what about you? Sometimes you quote Simpsons stuff to me and I'm just like, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, like I love the Simpsons, but you have this Simpsons recall that I cannot rival. <sighs> and uh it's it's so good. And, and and that's me being restrained too. Yeah, yeah. I don't I, the 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 stuff that's stuck in my head is like I don't, the stuff that I watched the most as a kid, right? So like Jimmy Stewart voice is always in my head because i watched um it's a wonderful life literally once a year uh-huh. every year as long as i can remember sure um christopher walken is always in my life i mean like bill murray was such a big part of my childhood so like i feel like his voice is always in my head um but i yeah i don't do the audiobook thing very often so i don't have like a lot of audiobook polls uh, as far as podcasting i think uh hardcore history what is his name? Dan Carlin. Yeah. His voice is so distinct to me 
And I think that's part of what makes that podcast like not just his voice, but his his uh, reading from primary sources voice where he like goes an octave higher uh-huh. and just gets a, like, I don't know. What, Faster. Like, yeah. yeah. At some point he decided that this is how he's going to read sources and he does it the same way every, anytime, yeah. no matter what the context of it. Um, well, that really sticks in my head. Well, even his his uh, his normal his normal voice for the podcast is basically like me doing this. Yeah. Uh, it's not actually the way he speaks because you can hear him speak normally on other interview podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, no, he's got a great voice. Absolutely. He, he has like a career in radio. So yeah, 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 it makes sense. He's not, he's not like us, just some <laughs> schlubs in front of microphones pretending like right. our voice is sounding good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, next up we have the the person who every week we struggle to pronounce their name, all 84001 <laughs> How much do you guys think the fact that Matt knew beforehand King would eventually be a character has colored his reading? Would he have been so keyed into all the metafiction references from the start? As someone who discovered the series as a kid and read and reread the, the subsequent volumes when they were published in real times, the meta turn was definitely not what I had imagined for the end game of the story during the long waits between the early books. What do you think about that, Matt? I, I, it, of course it colored you're reading in some way uh it can't not yeah um it'd be hard to trace down exactly because at a certain point the story like from a fairly early point the story is fairly straightforward with you that this is a multiverse yeah and that there's many worlds and there's doors between them um and the, and the metafiction aspect is is just it's just there right like you've got stuff like the the third book being called the wasteland and it's like yeah that's that's a t.s Eliot poem yeah um so but the the question is like well would i have guessed that we're gonna go in the direction of literally meeting stephen king the man who's writing the book and like no i i don't think i would have i don't think i would have guessed that um and i don't think i would have you know there's other stuff like the book really gives you a lot of hints that it's a story right Mm -hmm. but but it doesn't start doing that until i think wolves of the kala uh, where everything starts going 19 Mm -hmm. um and so and even and even then i'm basically sorry i'm kind of rambling like what i'm trying to do is like imagine that i didn't know that information and then walk through the series and say what would my impressions be i i don't think i would have guessed that we're gonna be going to earth so that we can interact with stephen king sure Um, sure yeah, but, but I, I do. I do yeah. think the meta portions, like we still would have talked about, because like yeah. I mean, there, there, and there's a question about this later, so I don't want to totally give our answers away. But I mean, I think just the way we're doing this, we would have. When you have to sit in front of a microphone and talk for two hours, like you're gonna, you're gonna pick at everything, and so mm-hmm. like when three weeks in a row, Stephen King is referencing the Wastelands, and then the book Shardick, and then Wizard of Oz, and, and like, like you're you're gonna you're gonna draw lines between those things and start forming a a theory a meta theory on the whole universe regardless of whether you knew stephen king was in it or not yeah i think yeah and i think you ask the same questions either way you ask like well why did he put shardik in this like what like what is the point of that reference Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah because i don't i don't think i mean i don't think the i don't think it's literally just like that'd be neat you know (laughs) Like, because, because really when you dig into these references, it's always a bit more layered than that. I, I, that's, that's one funny thing I'll just say about the um, epilogue is like, I don't actually think that King is as laissez faire about storytelling as he kind of portrays himself as being like, I think he, I think he puts more calculation and layers into things than the character of Stephen King in the epilogue does. I, I, I don't know. Do you agree with that at all? Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think it's, it's very romantic to look back at, at a finished story and say, wow, that just kind of flowed out of me. But uh-huh. like, he also works his ass off. I mean, he is, right. he is a workaholic. He works every day, constantly rain or shine. Like he, he, he writes and he writes and he writes and yeah, he doesn't like outline and like have the entire story in his head, but he does bang his head against the wall and, and try to force things through. And, and of course through the edit process, he refines and, and connects and, and themifies. I think like one of the things he talks about in, in on writing is that when he finished Carrie, like he hadn't actually 
realize that he was doing like this this blood motif mm-hmm. <laughs> until he, like his he subconsciously did it and then once he realized he was doing it and he saw the connection he went back into the book and and built that up a little bit more so yeah he's not just like sitting down in front of a keyboard and like pumping out a masterpiece yeah, like yeah. it's just that's not that's not how it works but you romanticize the process a little bit when you're away from it yeah yeah so i think that's fair cool so, yeah uh, that's, that's the best i can do with that answer because we we don't we don't have access to the level of the tower where i didn't know that information already yeah so. yeah yeah i mean I, it, I think it would be disingenuous of us to say that it did not affect how you looked at the story of course it of course it yeah did. sure yeah yeah uh, he also asks how I first came to the series. Well, I have a, a cousin who may or may not be listening to this right now. Hi, DJ, um, <laughs> who loved these books. And I went to visit him in Colorado, actually, not the part you live in, but a different part of Colorado. Um, and he uh, he was talking about these crazy books and how addicted to them he was. And it, I think the fourth one had just come out. So this was probably like 97 or 98. So I was like 12 or 13. Um, and, and I had not read much Stephen King. I, I came to Stephen King relatively late compared to the other the people we interview who say it was like ten or eleven. Um I was a little bit older. But I, I also remember when the It miniseries came out, I like hid behind the couch and watched it over my parents' shoulder because <laughs> I was so curious about it. And I was much younger. But um he seemed really into it. So I started reading it. Um and then I, I kind of put it away because it was another six years before the other books came out. I didn't read those right away. I think my dad read them first and my dad was so angry with the series after it ended <laughs> that it got me really curious to finish it. Cause he was just so mad about it. That I was like, well, I got to check this out. And uh, now like every time my dad and I get together, like every time he, at some point in the conversation, he will, he will bring up how much he hates Stephen King <laughs> <laughs> just to kind of rib me. Um, and uh, and and we fight we fight about the dark tower every time it's not i mean we're, not, we're just kidding around with each other i don't actually care that he didn't like it but uh it's just it's just a, a thing we do and uh, the rest of our family every time is like oh here we go again <laughs> yeah you know you've uh, told me this i don't think i've ever said to you that i i i i wonder if part of your motivation for wanting to do this podcast isn't to like have the canonical perfect persuasive argument for why you're right and 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 the series is actually awesome uh, yeah i mean not consciously <laughs> but i think there's probably some truth to that <laughs> well yeah there you go our parents i'm never uh, i'm never going to convince him i mean the thing about my dad is he like i i, I love him i love him he i don't know if i want to say this because we haven't gotten to the end yet but like okay he likes he likes his stories to end a certain way and if they don't end the way he likes he gets very angry with them um all stories not just stephen king stories and so uh he did not enjoy the way this this series ended and uh he okay. has a lot of words to say why and i disagree fundamentally with him but that's right. okay that's okay uh, okay cool um next question uh, Streffen Coat and several other people as well said with the final book on the horizon I'd like to know if Matt has any death predictions within the quartet will they all make it will it be a bloodbath when I read book six in 2004 which came out on my 18th birthday and had to wait for book seven I remember that this was something I pondered over endlessly I felt such <laughs> dread going into the final book with all the tets still alive and almost all of them in dangerous situations not to mention many of the characters accepting their mortality in uh song of susanna yeah so yeah we got this question like seven different ways from seven different people but they all sum- summed up we're basically like matt yeah. who's gonna die um yeah um <laughs> so i'm actually I, i'm gonna i'm gonna avoid doing the hemming and hawing and like and contextualizing because I, I i usually don't think in terms of like this is what i think is gonna happen i'm just like well mm-hmm. this could happen or this could happen and i but but the point is um i have this thing with reading where I'm especially, especially when, when we're analyzing like this, I'm always looking for the gotcha or the red herring. So whenever the author starts telling me this character is going to die, I start thinking, oh, they want me to think he's going to die, but he's going to pull a switcheroo on me and they're not going to die. And it's going to have been a dramatic reversal. And I've been wrong about that like every time. <laughs> um, 
ironically, uh, back when we did the Ward podcast, I was much better at predicting when characters would not die just because I was like, well, the, the author hasn't implied they're going to die, so I don't think they're going to die. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, I, I think that a lot of these characters are going to die. Okay. I'm just going to be, I'm just going to go straight forward and say, look, King has made us think that Callahan, Susanna, Oi are going to die. Very, very strong death flags okay. in this last book. So I'm just going to say, I think they're, I think those three are probably going to die. Um, I don't think Jake is going to die. I don't think Roland is going to die. Eddie is the biggest question mark because there's the, the biggest de- death flag for him, I guess, is the death will have slipped between them. So I I guess I'm just going to say Eddie's going to die. So this is my prediction. Everybody's going to die except Jake and Roland. That's my prediction. Okay. You're, you're, you pushed me to it. It's brutal. Cause look, cause normally I wouldn't do that. Normally I'd be like, look, there's many combinations of things that that can happen. And authors have all sorts of reasons for making you feel like a character is in danger, but I'm just going to go for it. All right. Well, that's part of the fun of these predictions, Matt, is you've got a lot of people listening intently one way or the other, no matter what you say. Yeah. So, and and uh, I, I see, see, I feel like I've learned not to, not to hedge and, and not to be like, well, they could just be messing with us. So now if I'm totally wrong here, then I'll learn that that lesson was also wrong and that I just sh- am worthless at predicting things. So there yeah, you go. But either way, it will be fun. That's true. Either way. Uh, on that same line, not who's going to die, but another prediction question. We have Matt said words as well as a bunch of other people who asked basically uh, Matt said words says after getting this far in the series, would you be willing to speculate on what could be at the dark tower? And that was a bunch of other people said as well. Like Matt, what is, what is at the tower? What is at the top of the tower? What is going to happen? How is the series going to end? What well, and Matt said words specifies what could be there that is so worth protecting? Um, well, I have this, so, so I, I was just assuming from the, uh, con, you know, from from the subtext of conversations and such that like the top of the tower is basically the seat where if you sit there, you're like God and you can do you can do, you know, impossible, amazing things and you can shape the world. And maybe you can, you know, maybe it just gives you this ability, you know, to to reshape things such that you could um, fix whatever whatever the Crimson King is doing wrong and potentially even you know repair the beams and 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 etc cetera, etc cetera. like you could really fix the world if you sat at the top of the dark tower that's my that's my feeling about like what the dark tower is it's, it's like the godhead it's the seat of it's the seat of god um but but i think i i think that roland is not going to get to the top of the dark tower um because for me that would be like him getting to the top of the dark tower would be a tragedy it would be it would be eddie shooting up again it would be um like the only way he gets there is if he sacrificed everything to get there and i don't want that to happen like that's mm-hmm. that's, that's the story we've set up right like if he gets to the yeah. top of the dark tower it can only be because he sacrificed everything and that would be so sad um so like i hope that he doesn't get to it and i don't think he will like that's a, that's a prediction um so so do you think he will not because he will not choose to. Um, yes. Okay. I, I think he will not. I think he will not choose to. I think, I think he will. I think there will be something that he won't be willing to sacrifice. Okay. And because, cause yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. All right. So how are they going to save the world if he's not going to get to the top of the tower? I don't know. <laughs> I have no right. idea. <laughs> That's that's the most we'll get out of you. Okay, that's the, fine. That's fine. I mean, Stephen King is a character in the story. There, are, <laughs> there are other ways to get to to go about things. I guess is what I'm saying there. Sure, sure, fair, fair. Okay, cool. I like it. I All like right. it, Matt. Awesome. Uh, Super Golem says, "Do you have any hypotheses as to what the other glass of the thirteen colored rainbow might be?" Um, they say they have a theory. They've, they've never researched it on purpose and, and they seem to not know the answer, but they have a theory. They say, we sort of know that the different glass balls channel some kind of negative emotions. The purple one brings envy to the witch and the black one seems to bring out the hate in people, whether in, in themselves or others, uh, of themselves or others, sorry. It's also already been established that the book It is part of the Towerverse. Now, who do we know that is an expert in channeling fear and is always seen carrying a red ball? 
Uh, I mean balloon around. That's right. I'm calling it Pennywise as one of the balls. And that's where he gets his power, at least partially. Cool. Uh, that's that's a very fun prediction, and I like it a lot. Um, the thing about the the rainbow is we don't actually know very much about any of them at all. And, and I actually like. This is actually something I really like about Stephen King and Matt, it actually touches back on a conversation we were having with Julia when we were talking with her about Tolkien and about Stephen King. And, and Julia didn't like the Lord of the Rings books as much because Tolkien is very, very interested in exploring every nook and cranny of that world. And if, if Tolkien had invented the 13 uh, rainbow balls, we would know exactly what each of them did. We would know where they're all located now, uh, how exactly the ones that are lost were lost, who had them, who lost them, what happened to them, because that is where Tolkien's interest lies, right? Stephen King is not that type of writer. Uh-huh. And I don't think he knows the answer to this question. Right. Um, I, I think he knows where the important ones are. And and we've gotten vague hints about the, the blue one, I think, is maybe with a, a, a group of muties. Um, I think one of them is supposed to be under Ludd, maybe. Um, we've got all these like hints. But we, the, the, the honest truth is we just don't know. And that is just that is King's philosophy, I think, on world building. And I've been not penalized, but people, people on our other podcast, on our worm and ward podcast have gotten annoyed with me because of my relative lack of interest in the depths of world building. Um, and and those books have very, very good world building. And it's not that I don't appreciate that and and think that it's good. And that, and that's, I, it's good in Tolkien as well, but it's just not something I care about as much. And I think that comes from my love of Stephen King and or is the reason why I love Stephen King is because he world builds just enough and no more. Um, and that's kind of, that's kind of what I think about these, these colored balls. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a setting element that's been introduced to flesh out the world. He, he yep. doesn't, he doesn't know. Uh, he doesn't know the backstories of all of the people at the Moss Eisley Cantina. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so if you want to believe that, uh, Pennywise is carrying the red slash crimson ball. Uh, sure. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Love canon it. accepted. Sure. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. great. 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 I, it's, it, that's, what's fun about it, right? Is that we don't know for sure. So we can build these, these head cannons and it's fun. I like yeah. it. Yeah. Next, we have complicated nine, five, 19, who says from the other works of Stephen King, what characters do you think you would like to see in a cotet on a journey to the dark tower with Roland or from Matt, since he hasn't read a lot of King books, what characters from other author works would you like to see go on a journey together with to the dark tower with Roland? Any combination would do complicated says I myself would love to see Holly Gibney from Mr. Mercedes trilogy, the outsider, Tim Jameson from the Institute, Larry Stu or Nick from the stand and Abra or adult Danny Torrance from Dr sleep matt uh you want to go external to stephen king first and then we can loop back to my answers so the 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 answer that my brain returned immediately is kind of i I don't even know if i can account for this but it would would be the character matt cawthon from the wheel of time (laughs) and i just think that would be a fun element to include here because like he's a fun character Mm. um he's not like overpowered in a fantasy sense although it would be interesting to see how his particular not only power, but attitude would work with the whole gunslinger thing. Sure. Um, I don't, I have, I really have no idea why that name popped into my head. Honestly, that's a, that is a weird, that, that is a weird brain thing right there, but I can't think of anyone better. So how about you? You gotta get some Frodo in there, man. Let's, come on, sure. Frodo, go with Roland. That, it would be very interesting, actually. <laughs> that would be very <laughs> that would be very interesting yes i was joking but then my brain started turning and i was like oh wait a minute uh, yeah uh, imagining conversations um for sure mm-hmm. as far as uh king characters uh i agree with your characters from the stand i think those would be really interesting i also really love adult danny torrance um he would be interesting i i mean it is is my favorite so i would love to see some of the it characters there i don't know whether i would want like child version of the characters from it or adult version of like of bill or beverly which i would want there but but some of those that'd be a lot of fun cool all right next question from hey wait no carrie white is the answer carrie Uh, white (laughs) carrie white before before all the bad stuff happened yeah we have a chance to save her there you go 
Or maybe she died and then she ended up in Midworld. There we go. Uh, next question. My name is Chris. Says, are there any seeds Side King planted throughout the series up to this point that you were surprised panned out to be such a major element in the story? For example, when we were first introduced to Calvin Tower and Aaron Deepno, I would have never suspected that they would become such pivotal characters. For my money, I would have thought it would have been those two businessmen playing Tic Tac or whatever, that Tic Tac Tower or whatever on some random, uh, on some random wall with a fancy pen. The same could be asked of the inverse. If there were seeds you thought King would certainly water into something important, only to to have it wither and be forgotten. This is a really hard question for me to answer because it's been so long um, since yeah. I've known everything that that we're getting myself back to a place where I remember like what I thought was going to develop that didn't or or what I had no idea was going to develop that did. And especially like the first time I read these books, I was not reading them critically at all. So it was just I wasn't like making predictions or wondering in my head. I was just like just going I was just going with it so uh, maybe you are better to answer this question but I, it, it's a tough one i'm not sure yeah i mean something that pops into my mind is like i really did not expect henry dean to be a continuing presence in the story the way he has been like mm-hmm. i was just like yeah it's eddie's brother he's dead now um and then he kind of grieved for him and yeah. then then we were done but then it's like no we were not done we came back we've we sort of keep coming back um and I think that's, you know, in keeping with the themes of the story that you don't really get over your past. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, I, I yeah. did not. I did. I do remember never thinking that the way station was going to come back into mm-hmm. play. I thought bringing Callahan through in the way station was pretty great uh, and, and pretty clever to to link those two characters that way. Um, yeah. I mean, so much. The, the The thing that really stood out to me is I think when King got to Wolves of the Kala and Song of Susanna and the Dark Tower in, in, in maybe a lesser extent, as, as we'll get to, I think he was very conscious that he was trying to round home, like, like head home with the story. And so I think the ways in which he starts pulling things from the gunslinger in a way that none of the other books had done, it was really interesting to me. Like, and I think maybe it's just because I, I just listened to the gunslinger on audiobook again just recently, but like the ways in which in song of Susanna, especially like he's pulling elements from the gunslinger in and, and there's a lot of repetition there in some of the things he's doing. Um, I think is, is really clever. Um, Uh And it's because he has, he's like, he's like a man on a mission, right? He's like, I'm going to end this now. And so I'm trying to make this thing come full circle. So I'm going to go reach back to that original novel and start to pull things in. Um, that maybe sure. he didn't have that objective when he was writing uh, Wizard and Glass. Yeah, I think you just have to do that as you're as you're closing a story. You have to you have to yeah. close all of your open parentheses. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I can't I can't think of the the inverse. I can't think of any places where I'm I'm, I'm surprised something wasn't picked up on. Um, but uh, I might. Yeah, I, I can, but I can't say it. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Next time. Next time. Okay. All right. Next, we have Shortstop88 who asks, we've seen many villains throughout the series so far. Sylvia Pittston, Walter O'Dim, Martin Broadcloak, Balazar, Jack Mort, the House Ghost, Gasher, Andrew Quick, Blaine the Mono, the Big Confidantes, John Farson, Rhea of the Coos, Randall Flagg, Andy, the Wolves, Mia, Richard Sayer, many creatures and goons, and the mysterious Crimson King. <sighs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that was a mouthful. So the question is, Matt, do you have any guesses on what enemies Roland and his quartet may face in the final book? First question, Matt. It's some bad guys. So, so no, no guesses. I mean, I think they'll face the Crimson King before the end because okay. it's an epic fantasy novel. Although they never actually did face Sauron. So if we're, if we're making Lord of the Rings comparisons, then I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't run into the Crimson King either. Um any other characters that you think we'll see back as as uh, antagonists? Um, well, I, th- I, I something's going to happen with this with this baby um, who is not dead. I'm trying to think through who's not dead. I mean, I think we're going to learn more about the Battle of Jericho Hill, so we might we might see via flashback some of these people like John Farson, who we never actually met, okay. um, that I can recall. Um, 
No, I don't I, like. I don't have a like. The, uh, people will be impressed at what a just blank space I have in my mind for like what is going to happen in this next book. I'm just like, I we're in crazy town, folks. Yeah. The the author just the epilogue of this book was the author writing his own hypothetical death. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but but yes, sure. I, I'm happy to to answer your questions regardless. So you answered one of his other questions was, do you think we're old enough to face off against the Crimson King? Oh, um, well, so you kind of answered that already. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think he will, but I also wouldn't be surprised if he didn't, because that would be actually a more direct uh, Lord of the Rings parallel. So, yeah. How, uh, how do you think Mia's baby is going to play into this whole thing? I mean, my my earlier guess was that it's like the time traveled Crimson King. Um, sure. Which... I, I like it doesn't make a lot of sense, honestly, but I don't have any better um, like like logical um, predictions for you there. So, OK, cool. I think that's it. Cool. So, All right. Let's move um, on. Yeah. Next question. Man of Zimmer says this is a follow up question from the mailbag question after Wolves. What do you think of the meaning of 19 now? Yeah, yeah Matt. Yeah. So I definitely. I think I think it's fair to say I was just wrong before. I mean, <laughs> I, I think I think that it's it's this sign of this this traumatic uh, you know accident event. I don't know what word to use. This terrible terrible accident King had that almost killed him and really kind of changed his whole attitude about uh, writing this series in particular and maybe 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 other things as well. Um, nine, you know, June nineteenth, nineteen ninety nine. I think that's that's what it means, but he's using it in a way where it means a lot more things. Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, I'd like your answer though. Cause I mean, you looked at, you made the logical leap of looking at the introduction to the very first book saying on being 19 and built it from there. When in actuality, I think what King did is he wrote that intro, you know, later in, later. in the, the latest edition. Yeah. And he kind of worked it, it, it either through coincidence or just through revision said, I wrote this book when I was 19. Um, yeah. And so like it just became this th through happenstance became this number that became very important to my existence and, and serves as, as a linking point between my, my beginning of this journey and the thing that almost ended it. Um, yeah. So exactly. It's, it's really cool. <laughs> it's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he's finding, I mean, it's part of the whole meta aspect of it where, where he's like, yeah. isn't it, isn't it interesting that I started writing this novel when I was 19 and then 19 became a number of power. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's fun. Next we have ghost of Dolomite who says, Scott, I think you've been a champion about not letting spoilers slip. Well, thank you. It's been very hard. Uh, Matt, is there anything you felt spoiled on by reading the series this way for the first time? Um, no, nothing that I hadn't already picked up before the show started. I mean, Everyone is, you know, Scott, Scott has been fantastic, of course. Everyone else has been fantastic in their um, uh, internet comments, tweets, what have you. I've never, I've never, I haven't, I haven't even gone out of my way to be super careful. I've been moderately careful about not reading far and wide. Um, but no one who, whoever has interacted with me or, or our, our uh, Reddit or whatever has ever spoken come close to spoiling anything for me so i appreciate all of you for doing that for for thinking you know for thinking about the fact that i might be there which mm -hmm. i sometimes am um so yeah no no I, I can safely say no like i've never i've never had to tell scott like oh man i just got spoiled on this thing this just never happened so yeah yeah it's it's been great y'all have been absolutely fantastic and while it has been difficult for me at times this it is it is is very hard it's very hard um I, i'm happy to hear that because, I mean, sometimes you just have to scramble, right? Like, I want to react instinctively to something you say, but I but I can't. Um, so you, you, it's like you have to have it's just it's just putting another filter over your mouth, which is something I don't have a good one of already. <laughs> so it's just like just an extra an extra brief second before you say something. Um, yes. Yes. I know exactly yeah. what it feels like. <laughs> So. But yeah, y'all y'all have been absolutely fantastic. So thank you for helping with that. We've got we've got ways to go. So keep it up. But uh, thank you so much for yeah. for not ruining this for Matt. We really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, and by extension, everyone else, right? 
Yeah. All right. Next question from Steve D. Although Cy King wrote these stories over the course of several years, how much time would you say has passed since the end of Drawing of the Three? Song of Susanna was only a couple of days. Their time in the Kala was just over a month. Wizarding Glass, maybe a week or two. Wastelands, maybe six weeks. Not exactly sure how much time transpired between drawing Wastelands, Wizarding Glass, and Wolves, but I wouldn't think more than a few weeks, maybe months. Time moves differently on these levels of the tower for sure. I mean... I'm going to have to just go with your analysis there and say, <laughs> um, I mean, th there were a couple of between book periods where, where Eddie specifically is like, I have no fucking idea how much time is passing right now. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then, and then it's just like, you know, you know, undefined number error there. You're just like, I don't, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, a, f a few months, I guess. Right. Yeah. Um, um, I, I can answer this maybe definitively, maybe not. Okay. So, the book I mentioned earlier, uh, the Dark Tower Compendium by Robin Firth, she she constructs a timeline um, of the series. And in her best estimation, it's about a year. It's about a year from uh, the drawing of the three to the events that are happening right now. So not exactly, but within within like eight to 14 months or something uh -huh. like that. But yeah, I mean like the thing about this whole thing is that time is weird. So while it may have been like a calendar eight months, who knows how long those felt like when you're journeying through them. So, yeah. And, and I don't recall weather, you know, being a yeah. thing. Right. So, so you can't go by has it, has, has, has it been winter, you know? Yeah. So I mean, King, like from the very beginning established this timey wimey weirdness yeah. of the world. So we have no, we have no confident firm grasp on this. Uh, I guess the answer is long enough, <laughs> long enough for these. I mean, Jake, I think they say looks like he's aged about a year. I think he, a year or two, like he's 11 when he first enters the world he looks 12 on the cusp of 13 at about now. Uh -huh. So yeah, eh, somewhere around there feels but. about right in terms of like how, how much, how, how well these characters get along and, and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but time soft. So yeah. 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 Steve also points out that Roland was training, um, as a gunslinger for like his entire life. And he, and he got the katat up to speed real quick. So he's a good yeah. teacher. Yeah, I mean it's the, the these are these are not these are chosen folk, right? Yeah, they're that's like true. they're they learn they learn quickly. They're very adept at picking up this stuff. They're they're born gunslingers, so yeah. Um, yeah. They didn't get as much training as he did, certainly, but also time. So who knows? Who knows? Yep. Good question though. Uh, Eric T asked a couple questions, and I think these are going to be like a an opportunity for us to talk about some broader stuff. But the first thing. He asks, is, this has been a nearly a career spanning work, and last week's discussion was about insertion of the author in the story. That's considered a bad idea. It goes against common quote unquote rules. It seems like King does that a lot in the Dark Tower. He says what'll happen and then works back to it, jumps POV from first person to third person, omniscient or other. His dialogue is choppy because it skips between external and internal monologue dialogue in a way that should be confusing. Choppy may not be the right word, but he uses the reader's own cognitive leap, so we'll make it make sense so so well that it makes sense where it's on the page it doesn't in a literal sense but it's all awesome because he pulls it off how much of this non-standard technique is him sitting down and trying to break the rules deliberately and how much of him is him just playing do you think are there technical aspects of his writing that jump out when comparing his earlier books to the later books within or without the series uh maybe matt you want to try this one first because like from yeah. my perspective i've read these books so many times that it all blurs together. My to impression kind of, of King as a human being, which could be completely off base, is that a lot of what he's doing is is playing and riffing and exploring and um, very literally being that that pantser. Um, mm -hmm. But but then, even as he's doing it, noticing what he's doing and and um, emphasizing it, and, and sure. you know, consciously taking the thing that he's just done unconsciously and then twisting it improving it emphasizing it um turning it into a motif instead of just a a fun thing that he noticed one time um so there, there you know i think i think all all real creatives are doing a constant interplay between conscious and, and unconscious 
sure. um, because uh, that's how you shape something really, really masterful. And so I, I feel like a lot of it is organic, but it's all being structured deliberately as well. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I mean, I think his dialogue has always had this kind of cognitive jumping. I mean, even if you open up Carrie and you see one of one of the the standards of early Stephen King that he's moved away from and, and re-embraced at various times throughout his career is this idea of in the middle of a external dialogue, he will put a parenthetical thought just like smack in a sentence, right? And that is something he's been doing from the very beginning. That is a Stephen Kingism. He loves doing that. He loves to have thoughts interject speech in a way that feels very true to the way our, our brains work. Um, and it's interesting because I don't think that thing plays very well in the audiobook version. I mean, I think they pull it off the best they can, but it always kind of plays a little weird because it doesn't stick out as much as it does when you have the text in front of you and you see like a page break, a paragraph break and a parenthetical with words in italics and then moving right back into the dialogue. I think it works really well written, doesn't work as well in audio, but he's always done that. Um, he's always had that kind of dialogue. And I think he just likes, he likes, it's not stream of consciousness per se, but it's not, not either. It's, I think it's closer to the way we think than the quote unquote accepted normal way of writing. Sure. Yeah. Um, and once you realize what he's doing and you accept it, then it's just, then it just reads as normal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I also just have this, this narrative in my head and I have no idea how much of this is true or not. And if I ever get to talk to the man, I will ask him, but I just, I just imagine him and he's, he's sitting down writing songs of Susanna and he's working towards this moment. He's working towards that, that famous chapter 11 that, that Julia didn't read. And he's like, am I going to really fucking do this? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just imagine him going, Tabby, I think I'm going to put myself in my book. <laughs> <laughs> and his wife going, Steve, you can't, you can't do that. <laughs> and I'm going, I know, I know, <laughs> but I think I'm going to do it. <laughs> Like I just I, I can see this happening to him. Like I, I think he's very conscious of the fact that doing this is a huge risk and, and if you don't pull it off, it's gonna blow up this life spanning thing. But I think it just felt right to him yeah. in a way that he could not ignore. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, again, you I'm sure you you know him better than I do, uh in, in the sense of having, you know, been in his mind much longer. Like I, I don't see him as the kind of person who's going to really worry for very long, you know, like he's just, he just does so much crazy shit in his books. <laughs> There's so many books and, and I haven't read them, but like so many of them have reputations of just being like, yeah, that was just like, like Tommy knockers is the one people talk about. We're like, yeah, it's just, it's just bad and dumb and weird. <laughs> And, and it's like, I don't think he was worried about it at the time. I think he just did it. And then in retrospect was like, that was stupid. All right, mm -hmm. next book moving on. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there are like, he's gotten stuck. Like I, the most famous example is he just like was in the middle of the stand and he just got stuck and he could not figure out what to do next. And he sat on the book for months, um, which is very unusual for him. Like he put it aside, started working on another thing. And then it, it, his solution just kind of popped into his head and occurred to him. So, I mean, he does think about the stuff. He does get stuck. He does get concerned. Like it, it's not this flowing process. So I don't know. I, I just, I just want that conversation to have happened. Like, I, like Tabitha King is just he, always his, I don't want to call her his, her his voice of reason but she's so important to his process because she is the first person who reads everything he writes she's uh, the the one who's willing to to call him out on his bullshit and and sell him straight on stuff so i'm just imagining like tabby yeah <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna do it I, okay, okay Stephen. i love it i love it yeah yeah all right. Uh, Eric T also asked us another question. He says, there have been a lot of themes floating for the different books. The addiction theme seems really strong, but beyond that, there were things like who, what Roland was willing to sacrifice to reach the tower, lying to oneself and to one's team versus telling the truth, absorbing slash accepting the past in order to access the future, the color thing, um, and the concept that Roland is being groomed to learn to love such that he is prepared to access his tower. 
So Eric wants to know to you, Matt, how do these hold up series wide and do any consideration, do any considerations of any give clues to what is coming up? So basically, these are these big, all-encompassing, book-wide themes you and I have been talking about all year, and here we're approaching the end. Do these things still fit into an overarching narrative? Do they still make sense to you? Where do you and how do you see them playing into this last book? Oh my god, <laughs> it's a bit. It's a big question. Um, I, I don't want to just repeat a lot of what I already said, but but the, the notion of you know the notion of addiction clashes with the notion of him being groomed to love. And you say, look, he either he's going to be forced to make a choice between these two things. There's tension here. That's it's wants mm-hmm. versus needs, fundamental character building concept. Sure. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll honestly be confused if somehow the book gets away with letting him get to the tower winning and not having, you know, become a monster to do so. I'll just be like, oh, okay, I, that's not where I, that's not what I thought we were doing with the book. Sure. Um, um, you know, uh, some of this stuff like Mordred, I don't know what's going on with Mordred thematically. I don't really have a handle on that. Um, I, I, he's, I, not I do, been, he's not been around long enough to really yeah, explore that yet. We don't yeah. really know. Um, I, I feel like uh, I feel like the the idea, not necessarily the theme, but the the concept of robots is something that's been throughout the story, and. Uh, uh, I feel like something having to do with North Central Positronics is going to be made a bit more explicit rather than just like this looming thing off to the side. Um, So maybe like, you know, what, what is, what is this more, more specificity around this theme of, you know, why robots in the story, you know, why, why this dichotomy between magic and, and rationality. Um, Sure. Sure. More, more along those lines. Um, and as for the color stuff, I mean, lust versus love, I feel like that's just going to continue to make its way through the story in, in different ways, but not not in ways that I can predict, really. So so I don't know. I mean, that's the thing about themes is a very powerful tool for like creating, but not necessarily a good tool for making predictions, unless, of course, like the specific prediction that I don't think Roland's going to get to the tower, That I guess that is a prediction motivated by themes. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the problem with an overarching theme is it requires the conceit of the story to to identify itself, right? Like, you mm-hmm. can say, like, addiction, but mm-hmm. addiction is really just a motif mm-hmm. where a theme is what the author is trying to say about addiction. Um, and so we can't, we can't really know that until we see what the conclusion of the story is. Um, is this and a so tragedy? It makes, yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so it makes, it makes using them as predictive tools pretty difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you can still make educated guesses because while this is an overarching story, like we've talked about, there are still individual stories within the story and those come to thematic conclusions. Yeah. Um, so you can, you can draw lines between those thematic conclusions and what you think the end of the book will be but uh it it makes it it makes it tough i I mean i still like i i do think all of these themes all of these motifs and everything we've been talking about throughout the story all the stuff is still very much in play and it's going to be interesting kind of talking about maybe how that's that these nebulous concepts coalesce into our conclusion Mm -hmm. um and if he's is he gonna pull them all together is he just gonna pull a few of them is it gonna be like yeah i really wanted to explore this concept of of honesty in this book but i didn't really need to pull that into the conclusion of my saga it was Uh a thing that worked in that our characters learned our lesson then we moved on from it i I, i'm not saying that's what's going to happen i'm just saying that sometimes when you're writing serially like this you can just you can abandon stuff right you said that that it was good for what it needed i did that part and now i want to talk about something else so yeah the idea of eddie like doubting himself back back in um uh the wasteland right he hasn't doubted himself in a while i don't think that's going to be a theme i think that was just a thing that eddie was struggling with sure sure um you know I, i just wanted to remark like you you maybe people who listen to this show don't know this but you had this famously good track record for making predictions uh when we were doing our worm podcast because you were the new reader and you would make predictions and you really nailed some really impressive uh predictions and um i i think i i think we 
have agreed for some time. Like the reason was you weren't thinking in terms of like what would be cool or (laughs) what has been, you know, not even necessarily like what has been foreshadowed. You were thinking in terms of theme. You were thinking in terms of what is this story saying? What is this author trying to do with this story? And what would make sense if we extrapolate that? via these characters and then you you know you got some really good predictions and it's like yeah well that makes a lot of sense if you correctly nailed the theme which you did so yeah yeah i mean well and that's like (laughs) the the thing about that is at the end of the day and we kept track of this my predictions were about 50 50 and so like the ones that i nailed are the ones that everyone remembers but like i also got a whole lot of shit wrong and it's like when you're making choices if you're making choices based on theme if you guess the theme right you nail it if you guess the theme wrong you're fucked because it's going to go the complete opposite direction of what you yeah. expect so yeah yeah like i saw this character and i saw what I, I i predicted we were doing thematically with that character and that allowed me to draw lines between uh who she was and and who she was going to eventually become but if i had gone the exact opposite way which is possible it would have just been totally wrong and yeah. it happened in many cases yeah and and the author can just choose to explore a theme in a different way than you expected while right right yeah yeah i mean that's so. I, that's i think the fun things about those books and this is another plug go read worm it's, it's excellent is i think what the author does in that book is is take a concept take a motif and he's not just he's not just doing one overarching theme he's exploring that concept from multiple angles and exploring it thematically from those different angles to see like what pops out like what happens if we if we take this idea and push it from this angle what what'll a character do and what does that say thematically and then we have another character that pushes against that same thing from a different direction and what does that say about that response to it and that's one of the coolest things about that story to me yeah absolutely i agree all right great questions eric thank you so much yeah that was a fun discussion all right next question from steve l um so they say they say well, number one Maybe Susanna isn't addicted to anything. She was infected with schizophrenia since the brick hit her head and finally, and and, sorry, and finalized when the train took her legs. Would that fit the plot line? Could that be the difference between her her and Roland, Eddie, and even Jake? Um, That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't want to say that, like, I like saying that she's not addicted to anything directly contradicts the text right but also just because Susanna says oh maybe I am addicted to this multiple to having these personalities inside me like doesn't necessarily mean that it's true I think the thing to me if you look at if you say that yes this is Susanna's addiction that Susanna is addicted to Odetta is addicted to Detta is addicted to having these different parts of herself personified in order to deal with different parts of her life that she's uncomfortable with um, that is an very internal addiction, right? That is entirely inside her. Eddie's addiction is very external. Roland's addiction is very external. Um, Jake, what is a Jake addicted to? That's interesting. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't have a good... Um, I, it's, it's weird. I feel like I should have an answer to that, but I don't. Yeah. But I mean, setting Jake aside for a moment, Eddie and Roland, it's it, heroin, the tower, right? These are very external. These are things that you want. Whereas Susanna's is, I these are personalities that I want. These are personalities that I embrace. So it, they come from a different direction. And I think that helps define why Susanna feels so different from the rest of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I, I, I agree with all that. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I feel I feel like I'm... I feel like it's kind of what we were just just saying um, to Julia. Like, I don't feel confident in asserting things about Susanna quite yet. Actually, yeah. yeah. So I thought she brought brought up a great point that that she's she's a, a, a mystery of a character as compared to the other ones. Although yeah. I do think like we couldn't talk about this with her because she hadn't finished the book, but I do think the, as she correctly predicted the wrap up of the story really helps us define Susanna in these important ways. Like yes. Susanna kind of becomes this, this avatar of this, uh, this, you know, raging against the dying of the light, right? This, this 
positivity this was this, the the white kind of personified um in this like resistance against badness and and that's what the song of Susanna is about and that's what Susanna is about this 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 stubborn persistence in the face of unimaginable horror yeah yeah i i love that i, lo- I love all of your Susanna thoughts I, <laughs> I have very little to add there that's great yeah uh the the um there, there was a subsequent question by Steve Al. They said, what novel and series have you re- reread the most times? Um, definitely The Wheel of Time for me. I just, there was a period in high school where I just like reread The Wheel of Time is what I did. It was, it was, like, it was like a pastime. I, I, think it, I think I just like carried them around at school and I'd read them during the dead times, which was a lot. And so I just did that for, I don't even know how many times I got through it. Anyway, yeah. I, I was never a huge book rereader. Um so series, I think, is The Dark Tower uh, and book, I think, is it. It's all Stephen King. I didn't anticipate that, but I guess I shouldn't be that surprised. I think I've read it four times and I think I've read. I think this is my third time through Dark Tower, maybe fourth. I, mm-hmm. I don't, honestly don't remember. Uh, yeah. I don't reread that much. In individual novels, I would say um, Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson and um, Blind Sight by Peter Watts. Uh, would be the two individual novels that I've, I I don't remember how many times with either of those, but at least three each. Those are Um, like the most mad answers ever. Of course. Yeah. (laughs) I love it. Um, And then finally, uh, 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 is Stephen King the best American author of all time? Um, (laughs) Can I just say yes? And so I don't have to hurt my brain thinking about it because that's a tough one. See, if if, we just, just allow best to mean whatever you think it should mean and then just say yes. So, okay. Yeah. There, there we go. go. We solved that. Yes. Yep. Um, sorry, every other American author, who I'm sure is great. <laughs> I'm googling best American authors right now just to see what this Google search comes up with because I'm very curious. I mean, like they they all go to like the traditional ones, right? Like Hemingway, Faulkner, Twain, Steinbeck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, eh. who wants to answer that stuff? I, I think best just means best selling. That's what best <laughs> means. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, you could probably convince me that there are some better ones, but uh, for the purposes of not driving myself insane, I'm going to say yes. Okay. Good. Ian B says, one thing I thought about a few weeks ago as you were discussing the different pop references made by King and similar ones made by both Sayer and Walter or Sayer slash Walter is now that King has entered the story and we have even seen how Roland and Eddie are both reflected in his looks, mannerisms and speech. I wonder, what do you think about how King is reflected in his antagonists, specifically how the way Sayer and Walter both seem to have pre-knowledge of events, both in in the story and historically? Is this another of King's self-effacing moments, or is he trying to tell us something about the nature of these characters through the illusions they make? Is King hinting at something in the nature of Roland's nemeses and their connections to his quest? Often he remarks how they both do this seemingly for their own pleasure. I also wonder if the answer to this will be different by the end of the series. Um, I mean, I guess I'll go f- first. Like I, yeah. I've felt for some time that th- there's some particular reason why um, Walter O'Dim knows all this stuff and is the way he is. Like something happened to this man or, or he has some power or he has some vision and like, like he, like he, he seems to be the, to be the archetype of the one who knows too much and it's driven him mad. Sure. Like, like he seems like a guy who just knows everything that's ever happened and will happen. And thus he like no longer experiences meaning or, <laughs> or, 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 or humanity. And he's, and he's just completely detached and, and psychopathic because he, he has, he's, you know, the curse of knowledge, the, the, the wizard who's become so powerful that he's detached from humanity. That's, that's the archetype there, whether we're going to learn like, okay, what, you know, what exactly was it? Like, I I don't know. I, I I think King tends to keep things mysterious where he can. So I lean towards saying that we don't ever find out why exactly Walter is who he is. But if I had to say like, well, generally speaking, why is he who he is? I think, I think he does have foreknowledge and, and he, he, um, he's too powerful. He's too powerful to fit into a human body and it's driven him mad. That's my thought. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I, this is this question I really like because we do talk so much about how our protagonists reflect Stephen King. I mean, and, and as Ian points out, the book makes this textual, right? But we don't talk about 
how his antagonists reflect who he is. Um, and if we say that an author is putting themselves into their novel, we have to assume that on some level, Stephen King is his antagonists as well, or at least a part of Stephen King is his antagonists. And I mean, it's really fun to think about, like, I do think as we see of Stephen King in this book, he is a very self-effacing person. He is brutally honest about his faults and, and his flaws. Um, and I, I do, do not put it past him to, to recognize perhaps <laughs> to get really goofy with it. His propensity for random pop culture references that nobody around him understands is something he channeled <laughs> into these characters. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, may, maybe that's all it is. Sure. Yeah. I I don't know. Um, you know, I, I think about stuff like T and Jaffords saying, you know, low Kamala is when you just want to hurt somebody, you just want to be mean for no reason, mm-hmm. specifically for no reason. Right. And I feel like that's, you know, King doing that brutally honest thing and saying like, yes, I feel that way sometimes. Yeah. Don't. And then he's kind of looking at you via the book and saying, don't you don't you feel that yeah. way sometimes? We don't want to admit it, um, but I think you know. I think especially when I was a kid, and I was a bit more, a bit more psychopathic because I hadn't quite grown those empathy circuits yet. Um, <laughs> I, I was I was more capable of that kind of of thing. But but sure, I mean, uh, uh, it, the 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 kinds of evil the king has in his stories are very often the kinds of things that like normal people like you and I could find ourselves doing in the right circumstances. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think he is putting himself in those positions. That That is King saying, what would I do? What would I do in this terrible, awful situation? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, and the temptation to do evil is always there, I think. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that's cool about writing is you get to you get to play that that out. It's like, here's what I wanted to do in this situation. I didn't do it because it felt wrong to me. But like, what if I yeah. could have? What yeah. would that look like? And that's a lot of his evil characters or what if I was weaker or or um, if, if I was honest with myself, how would I act? I mean, like to talk about a book you haven't read, but a movie you've seen like Jack Torrance in The Shining is is very much Stephen King wrestling with the worst side of his alcoholic behavior. And he turns it up to 11 in that character who's very, very terrible at times. But like, I think, I think he would admit that, that that was inside of him. Um, and, and it's part of the addiction and part of the alcohol transforming him into this, this person who would be capable of doing these things. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Sure. hundred percent. Yeah. Next question. Mario. I says, I got sucked into the Dark Tower in the mid-90s after reading Insomnia, not knowing that the Wastelands ended the way it did. At the end of the Wastelands, I was prompted to write the only fan letter I had ever written. In the letter, I laid out my dismay at the prospect that King could die before the tale was finished and who would end the story. How would we know how the tale ended? Would someone else have to finish it because it was too important to remain unfinished? I received a form letter back a while later letting letting me know that Wizarding Glass would be released soon. You have no idea how bad I felt when he had the accident. I was wondering if you guys had some thoughts on what would happen to the story if he never finished it. Who would you have picked to finish if Steven hadn't? Um, um, I I would hope it just remained unfinished. As much as it would have broken my heart to not see how it all wrapped up, I can't imagine someone picking this up and, and doing it right. Um, yeah. Like, realistically, maybe one of his son's would do it or his wife i i i I just don't know why like like honestly like why bother like it's not the story it's not the story i mean i I, maybe people disagree with me on this but like i i didn't much care for the last wheel of time books that were not finished by the original author and if i really think about it i'm like well that wasn't the last wheel of time books those are two other books written by brandon sanderson Mm -hmm. those are the well, the wheel of time was never finished. It, it it sucks. Like it, like you don't want it to be true, but clearly, those aren't like like books not written by Stephen King, who is of course a pantser and didn't leave an outline for how this series was supposed to finish, <laughs> right. would not be the end of the Dark Tower, right? Uh-huh. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I I mean, if if something happens to George R. R. Martin, it'll be a terrible tragedy. I'll be sad. I don't want anybody to finish the series because mm-hmm. because it, it is finished. <laughs> that's the sad truth yeah yeah i I think i think that's it's it is sad um but 
it's not like books are so personal, right? Like at least movies, like that's a, that's a creation by committee. You have a huge team of people that are working their ass off to make something. And so if you lose the director or the writer, um, it won't be the same, but it could still be part of that world. But books are the creation of one person, one singular person. And I just don't think you can sub that person out and it'd be the same thing. Yeah, I agree. You just can't do it. Yeah. Uh, Spooky Maru says, speaking of Susanna's song, y'all listen to any songs based off the series? There's a surprising amount of tower music, though they tend to have some spoilers, as expected. My personal favorite is Somewhere Far Beyond by Blind Guardian, though I recommend listening to it after book seven uh, i i honestly have not listened to any song i mean i love the fact that people like created songs based on their experience at dark tower that's awesome and i love it but i've not listened to any myself with the exception of i think a couple that one of our listeners sent us a few months ago um i this is the kind of thing that i would not look into on purpose because i want to yeah. avoid spoilers but i i look forward to looking into it when the time comes uh, also have you ever attached a song set of songs or even album to a book or show like you forever associate them with each other? Um, not on purpose. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I'm, I'm trying to I'm think. Sure I, I'm sure I have. I, so I'm not a music person. I mean, I love music, but I'm not like, I don't think about music in that way. Um, I, I mean, it's it's not, not the answer you're going for, but like I, I am a, a big listener of soundtracks. Um, I love listening to movie soundtracks. Uh, it used to be like in high school, I was I was definitely really super cool because all of my CDs were like movie soundtracks for movies, not bands. Because why sure. bother with bands? Um, super cool behavior, um, and I still do that, frankly. Um, and and so like, what songs do I associate with a uh, with a show or or movie? Uh, well, the soundtracks because I just <laughs> I love listening to them. Book, yeah. I have no idea. I don't I don't do that. I don't associate books with music. yeah me neither i mean in in movies it'll just be the needle drops in the movies right like that like the ones that stick out to me the most i mean i love soundtracks too but like the ones that stick out to me the most are when they just drop songs like in, sure. into movies and yeah. and i just relate that song to that movie yeah. um like i think did we watch Donnie Darko together? I feel like the first time I watched Donnie Darko, I was with you. But yes. Mad World and Donnie Darko. I yes, have this that happened. Very, yeah. <laughs> yes, I with, being, with my ex-girlfriend. Being, that was fun. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember being in college? Where, like, no, no shame on Donnie Darko. But remember thinking that was like the, the best, best thing in the world? Best movie ever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it's a good so, movie. I, so I heartbreaking. Speak. Yeah. All right, next question from Denny F. Here's a question I imagine many of your constant listeners have asked themselves. How come after Scott signs off each episode, Matt can always be heard saying something, and what is he saying? Um, <laughs> Scott, give me, a, give me a take. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. I didn't realize people couldn't understand that. I mean, I know I'm slowly increasing the volume of the background <laughs> music up as you say it, but I thought it was audible before the background really swells but i guess not i mean maybe so I'll, it's, I'll fix that maybe it's like speaker dependent or or, or you know compression could, dependent or something who knows could be yeah he's saying may you have twice the number that's yes. what he's saying that's right every single time was, the same thing i'm so now i wonder if like like four thousand people <laughs> don't know what you're saying <laughs> uh, <laughs> i'm sorry everyone that's my that's editing fault. That's my fault. I'm a bad audio engineer. I'll fix it. In this episode, you listen. It'll be there. All right. Uh, we have Pear Jane who asks, I usually post in a write-up, but I'm dying to know from Matt, how do you listen to your audiobooks? I can't listen to podcasts or audiobooks unless I'm doing something, walking, housework, etc. Do you just sit and listen? Mostly um walks, yes. I, I do I, I I enjoy going on walks, especially during these times. Uh, housework yes um, um sometimes playing a game like starcraft where i'm not using that part of my brain at all like it's a it's a it's a hand-eye coordination game and so i can just listen um mm -hmm. and uh and, and on occasion like lying in bed and, and falling asleep but i don't like to do that that's usually only if i'm just too into the book and i can't 
stop um, because because I know that I'll drift off and I don't want to miss stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, that that's basically it. Yeah, that's. I mean, I I am continually like fascinated by your ability to listen to listen to pod or to to audiobooks for a show that you have to like really dive into because like i can't i can't do that like i i listen to audiobooks but i almost universally listen to audiobooks that i've read already because like i don't know maybe i'm just ba- my attention span just sucks but like i just can't absorb it as well unless i already know like exactly what's happening and where it's going and i can i'm just like appreciating it on a different level i don't know it's just something weird with me so i'm continuously impressed that you're you're reading these books this way and also are still totally in sync with what's going on and everything and and picking up on all the details and stuff i mean it's it's really cool i mean maybe there is a a brain thing going on but i i also think it's possible that if you demanded that of yourself you would find that you can do it 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 just seems difficult because you've never put yourself in that spot but who knows that's fair that's fair uh cool uh next question from rl raider mailbag question instead of march's madness what about december discordia (laughs) (laughs) this is going to take some explanation so uh for our for our ward podcast um scott scott actually runs this like 100 percent, and he does a great job on it every year but he he does a, a march's a march madness elimination tournament for people's favorite characters from the worm ward parahuman stories and uh lets the fans vote in you know several weeks of subsequent elimination brackets to find the best character and 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 so forth um so december discordia scott what do you think uh i would i would love to do that i my december is so busy i have so much going on that actually takes quite a bit of time to Uh organize and do like you have to you, like you, you got to get collect all the characters. You have to seed them, um, and I try to be as accurate as possible with my seedings, which they normally are. Actually, they, yeah, um, you nail it. But um, also, there's like two hundred some- characters, like two hundred named characters in Fairy Humans. I don't think there's that many in this series. So. There's, no, I mean, we could probably like it, it might not be like a sixty four team bracket. Maybe it'll be a thirty. It could be a thirty two team. Probably not. Um, I, I, I want to do something again in March. I don't know what it's going to be since we're not reading Parahumans. So we'll, we'll be doing other stuff. So I, it might be Dark Tower themed. It might just be movie themed. I'd love to do like a like a Doofcast, like <laughs> best movie ever tournament. That'd be That'd fun. Be fun. Yeah. Um, it's probably not December Discordia, no. I'm I'm moving in December. I we My wife and I bought a house and we're, we close on the second and we'll be moving. So it's going to be a crazy month for me on top of everything else going on. So probably won't have time to do it, but we're definitely going to do something else in March because we got to do something to distract ourselves from the world. Yeah. Maybe we'll. Uh, Nikki Lay asks, have either of you read the sort of truth series by Terry Goodkind? I would love to listen to you guys do a deep dive of those books. So good. Matt, have you read the, I've never read sort of truth. No, I have, I have not. Um, I had a kid on on the bus in uh, in uh, ninth grade. Just tell me, just tell me the entire sort of truth series. Why did they do that? Uh, you didn't have that friend who <laughs> would just who would just tell you the entire book that they were reading. Um. Anyway, yeah. Uh, no, I've never read them. Um, no, I had I had a, I had good friends. Oh, and I. I had a couple, a couple of those. <laughs> I did have a boss who would do that with with movies. Yeah. I had a boss. I worked for him for two years, and I met I, like he was the CIO of the company I worked for, and so he was really busy. So we only got to meet like once a month, and I would spend the first half hour of the meeting telling him what I was working on and how it was going, and then the second half hour he would just start telling me about a book he was reading or a movie he was watching, and he would just do that. He would just explain the uh-huh. entire plot to me. And I would just be like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what what weirded me out, though, was then when I was older, it, still in high school, this this girl was, like, asking about the book that I was reading in class and, 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 like, want, and like, wanted me to tell her everything that happened in the book. And I was like, I, I, you're not, you can't be enjoying me <sighs> telling you this. Like, like, just read the book. Anyway. Matt, she just liked you. <sighs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I know. Anyway. <laughs> so, Look, I'm so disappointed I, I in guess, teenage Matt right I, now. I guess I'll keep telling you about the book. 
Um, Just go read the book, stupid. Leave me yeah, alone. God, leave me alone. I'm trying to read. Um, <laughs> oh, to be a teenager yeah. again. Yeah, I totally had a crush on her too. Anyway. Um, <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> last question. Uh, Dale M says, I'll keep it simple and non-tower related. Just curious what you lot think of the greatest television show ever, Breaking Bad. Uh, I mean, it's the greatest television show ever. I love Breaking Bad. I love Breaking Bad. It's so good. Um, I don't love the fact that after Breaking Bad, like every TV show in existence got obsessed with the anti-hero archetype because no one's going to do it as well as that show did it. Um, but I love Breaking Bad. In fact, I guess I'll say this here because maybe it'll force me to commit to it. One of the projects I want to take on in in 2021 is get into video essaying and video editing. And one of the things that I've contemplated sticking my toes into is doing like an episode by episode exploration of Breaking Bad, you know, however many years removed from the show coming out. Um, you said it on air, man. I, no, I got yeah. yeah um so i mean like here's what i here's what i want to my goal for 2021 is to do that with the pilot <laughs> and, <laughs> and see and see what that ex- and like just play with it and see what that experience is and like what's writing an essay about the pilot look what's filming a video essay what's editing a video essay and what's releasing a video essay that is of high enough quality that i feel like it's worth my time so I, i'm not committing to do that with the entire series but I do want to explore video essays and that's a show that I feel like I have a lot to talk about. Um, uh-huh. So I, I want to give that a shot. So subscribe to us on YouTube and maybe you will see that sometime next year. Yes. Uh, Breaking Bad is like, is like the perfect show according to me. So um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get, maybe we, I guess we don't talk about it on this show, but I, I'm, I'm sure that I've mentioned Breaking Bad as my, one of my favorite things in the world elsewhere. Yeah. So and Better Call Saul, also really good. Really good. Vince Gilligan, man. Dude yeah. runs a good show. Yeah, yeah. He's a cool guy. Yeah. All right, uh, that's it. That, this is going to be such a long episode because I'm looking at our time right now and it's probably going to be our longest episode ever, which our overview episodes are usually our shortest. But we had a, a, a lengthy conversation with Julia and I wanted to include all that and we wanted to answer all your questions. So screw it. It's going to be a two and a half hour episode. You can't stop me. Yeah. And I'm and the editor. That's not right. You. That, that's that's right. You're you're in for the long haul now. We can do whatever we want. <laughs> yeah. Um. Thank you, everyone who sent in like I, I did not expect us to get as many questions as we did because I thought we just did one of these six weeks ago and this book was so short. But uh, I also forgot that like this is this is it right. This is this is the last moment before we dive into the final book. So I think people just really wanted to get in your last thoughts before you start knowing what happens in the next book, before you start knowing what the tone is, what the, what the, the feeling of the book, what King is going for in this final final chapter. So yeah, fair. That's fair. So thank you, everyone, for those questions. I think they were all really, really great. I had a lot of fun answering them, Matt. Yeah, yeah, that, that, I, I agree. That was a fun. That was a fun conversation. Yeah, and that is it for us here on Kingslingers. Next week, it begins book seven, the final book, the Dark Tower, awaits. We'll be covering next week part one chapters one through four we're gonna be here for a while matt it's a it's a 13 episode book so we're gonna be here for the next 13 weeks but it begins next week i can't wait i hope you're all very excited awesome remember you can reach us at uh, email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on twitter at kingslingerspod and um i guess there's no discussion question right now but you can still discuss this episode you can you can discuss uh, our answers to your questions you can discuss our conversation with julia um on the subreddit at r slash doof media yep yep and if you're not already subscribed to kingslingers we do strongly recommend you do so you're not going to want to miss these final 13 episodes you can find us on itunes stitcher spotify youtube google play and pretty much anywhere else in the world you can listen to podcasts also uh, Doof Media, our our parent company. I call it a parent company, although I we are the <laughs> yeah. parents. Our um, company, yes. Our company. That's the better phrase. Uh, we occasionally run art contests and and writing contests, and there's actually a, a writing 
competition going on right now. One of our shows that we've talked about on here is called Do the Right Thing, and it is a writing prompt podcast where they give you three words and you spend 30 minutes writing a short story and then the, they talk about it on the podcast. It's a great way to get writers out there into writing. And every quarter ish um with that that show hosts a thing we call the doof the right thing writing contest where you can look over the prompts from the last quarter um and pick one of them write a story edit that story and then submit it and then uh, our patrons will vote on their favorite stories out of that bunch and the winners win money like real real money this is patron funded prizes that we hand out to the the stories that are submitted so yeah. if you are a writer and you have ne- you don't have to have ever listened to an episode of do the right thing though we do recommend it um you can grab those prompts and write a short story it doesn't have to be that long since it's only supposed to be something that took you three 30 minutes to write you edit it and then you go to our website and see the do for the right thing contest which we will put in the show notes here and you see the rules and you enter and you could win some moolah yeah it's a great bite-sized length of a story if you're the kind of person who 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 has trouble getting themselves to write it's it's a very short chunk so yeah yeah. i think it's it's a great exercise i love that they do this every week and they they draw three new three or four new words every week you pick three of those words you write for a little bit and then uh it's just a good great exercise and then every quarter ish you could (laughs) you win some some prizes that's right if you like any of our shows and you want to support them, then please consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia. This week, special thanks to new patrons, new Bidoof John R., new Doof Dancer Sam S., and new Doof Troopers Shannon, Ellie H., Harold W., West M., Drew H., and Dan H. Wow. Awesome. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoy the the cool stuff that we have on those, on those various tiers. Um, this is great. Yeah. yeah, the feedback for our carry episode was was very positive. So thank you to I, I think a lot of those people perhaps joined to get a look, check to get to check that out. Um, and we really do appreciate that. Uh, uh, it makes me happy. Thank you so much, everyone. And if you cannot afford to donate, of course, that's OK. Donating helps us so much, but so does sharing the podcast. So does uh, sending it to your friends. So does sending it on Facebook groups, on Reddit groups, on whatever. Please, please, please share our show. We want to get it into as many constant reader ears as possible. Uh, One way that you can always help us out with that is by leaving us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. This week's spotlight review comes from Nuth UK, who gives us five stars and says, an excellent reading companion. Brilliant podcast. I'm rereading the series along with these guys, and the podcast is an excellent supplement. Thank you so much. That's they, They said excellent multiple times. That makes me feel so happy. Yeah, me too. Excellent. Excellent. All right, folks. That's it. We're finally done for this week. We'll see you right back here next week as we begin the final novel of the Dark Tower series, fittingly called The Dark Tower. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. Thank you for being very clear in your enunciation of that final final phrase there, Matt. 